Coming up on this week's edition of the Mindset Podcast, episode 175, we talk about the police smoking pot, the police hiring, Nelson Mandela's death, McDonald's striking, and some intriguing DNA evidence. Here's the music. I bid you welcome. BBC News from BBC World. This is an NBC News special report. This is a CBS News special report. Hello, a very good morning. You're watching BBC News with Carrie Gracie and Simon McCoy. From ITN News at 10. Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be around this wild, wacky, and sometimes disturbing world of ours. This is... The Mindset Podcast, coming at ya. I'm Gareth in Los Angeles, California, and joining me sprinkled throughout the globe, we immediately go 5,000 miles to the UK, and the one, the only, Mr. Ben Emlyn Jones. Hello, Ben. Hello, Gareth. It looks like I'm the only Brit on the panel today. You are, yeah. Is Alex going out? To, he's, he's doing tea bag hunting, isn't he? He's run out of tea. <laughs> well, I don't know whether he's tea bagging, Ben. Uh, <laughs> no, but, uh... Sorry, I was... <laughs> I shouldn't have worded it slightly differently. He um, does tend to. I, I don't know, man. I, I, uh, maybe he'll show up. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't really heard from Alex this week, but uh, no doubt he's get, he's busy with work and uh, the holidays are coming up and who knows what other nonsense he's got going on. So he's probably up to his eyeballs, but no doubt he will return uh, in the future sometime. Uh, so how have you been? Not bad, mate. Not bad. Been a busy old week. Lots of people dying, unfortunately. I mean, we've had them. Um, we've lost someone on CMR. One of those hosts died, which is very sad. Yeah. Um, Seems there seems to be happening a lot. Of course, Colin Wilson has just died. Right, yeah, I saw that. Uh, celebrity deaths like Nelson Mandela, Sylvia Brown. Oh, Sylvia, I was devastated with Sylvia Brown, dude. Oh well, yeah, I mean, no, not. To, I'm, I mean, kid, I'm kidding. All, I'm kidding. Uh, I know <laughs> the skeptics are all having a field day about it, and they're, they're not exactly weeping. I think they're, most of them have been quite dignified about well, it, but I mean, you know. they're certainly not um, weeping about it. Yeah, I mean, she always awesome. came off as a bit mental. You know, the things she would say, mm. you'd be like, "Okay, all right," uh, you know, and she and she said a lot of stuff which was um, obvious nonsense, and and, yep. and was proved to be so. I think the, the TV networks used her as much as she used them, and she was yeah, really yeah. a victim of her own success. There, I, I would you know. agree. I would agree. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Speaking of victims of success, let's shoot straight over <laughs> over the the Atlantic Ocean. And while uh, I'm freezing here in L.A., uh, someone is having a great old time lounging <laughs> around in the beautiful sunshine. I'm talking, of course, about Joe Dunn. Hey, Joe. Hey, Gareth. I am a victim. <laughs> uh, vic- a victim of uh, a nice weather here today. <laughs> What's up with that, dude? Like, Come I, on. I can't help it. It's fucking I... freezing here in L.A. It was cold here last week. Uh, that's how it is. It's crazy. Like one week it'd be a little bit cooler, and the next week it's back to the. We had a warmer. cold snap. Cold snap. At least with the, at least that's what the fucking retards on TV is calling it. Yeah, we're getting a bit of a cold snap here in L.A. It should uh, burn off by midweek, and then we'll be. <laughs> I'm like, get the fuck out of here, you stupid ass. Yeah, I know. That's how it is here. Um, yeah, it feels like forever since I've uh, been on the show. Uh, we missed because la- of the holidays last week. Yeah, you were uh, you were out camping, right? Out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, we went out camping um, and, uh, right after Thanksgiving, survived Thanksgiving. So it was nice to get away for a little bit, yeah. get my mind detached. Um, detached. Yeah. How was your Thanksgiving? Well, I, as I've said on many other shows, and I really don't want to repeat it again this on this show, uh, but it was good. It was fun. That's good, man. Yeah, um, good. I remember uh, one thing that happened. Uh, well, actually, didn't happen. I liked nobody brought up politics. You know, really? That's one of the things that you always have that happens at Thanksgiving. I noticed when everybody's <laughs> eating, somebody will bring up some kind of po- political yeah, thing, or, munching away on their tongue. Hey, what do you think yeah. about that fucking Obama? <laughs> 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 like, oh, so I was like, I was really happy I didn't happen. <laughs> and I, I usually just be keep quiet anyway. Yeah. But uh, I don't like that. Universal health care. Ha ha ha. Pass me, yeah. the, pass me the, <laughs> pass me the. Green and I'm sure everybody knows what I'm talking about. Either people bring these this kind of stuff up. You got everybody together, the families and yeah. different opinions. And 
Well, there's always that dilemma, right? Because if you got some retard at the dinner table who brings up politics, and and he or she, usually a he, is very opinionated, opinionated, and they have their points of view. So you're sitting there eating, and you're thinking, okay, do I just ignore this fool, or do I say something and take this thing to a whole new fucking level? Yeah, it's, just, it's probably best just ignore it. You know? you know enjoy, I mean? enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the holiday. Right. Do, do you just sit there and pretend he's not talking, or do you engage him and possibly ruin the entire night? <laughs> you know? And then you add alcohol into the mix. So. Oh, yeah. The, the, then your resistance to, to bite your tongue is, is kind of cut in half immediately. Right? Because yeah. once the alcohol will kind of loosen you up, and you'll say shit you usually wouldn't. Trust, well, that, trust that's me, not going to happen today I, on the show. That's I've been sure. in that situation many times. <laughs> yeah. But speaking of alcohol loosening people up, let's shoot straight up to the to the north and the one and only Trevor Murray. Hello, Trevor. Good good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Just um, stoking the fire up here. It's, it's <laughs> minus 35 in Alberta. So <laughs> you guys talk about... Uh, being a little bit of chill down oh, in yeah, California, man. I'm like, oh my no, god! No, we're in California, yeah. dude. As far as the weather's concerned, we're just a bunch of pussies, <laughs> right? We're just a bunch of of limp wristed fucking pussies. I mean, it's 40 degrees right now, and everyone is walking around and acting like it's they're living in the North fucking Pole. I'm serious. It's funny because on the news up here, yeah, they're reporting the weather in California. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, oh my <laughs> yeah. god, we we I got my parka on and uh, yeah, you know, I, I practically got a dog sled team out <laughs> ready to <laughs> go. Mush, mush. <laughs> yeah, it's oh yeah, man. It's, uh, I, I, you know, I like I said before, the older I get, the less I I, I want to spend time here. I, I'd love to have a. A little uh, place in Las Vegas. The wife really likes it. So oh, we, yeah, man. Vegas. We'd love to have – because where we're at from Calgary, we can drive there in a day. Uh, well, I mean like 15 hours. Two people, you could you could drive there. So you could we, Wait, we, you could drive from Calgary to Vegas in 15 hours? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty much a straight shot. No just, shit. Yeah, it's uh, – I was surprised too at the the, uh, the, the – the amount of time it's would, uh, i mean i mean you, what we would do we would do it in two days but i mean if two people were yeah, two you guys could, you could, want to jump down right, to right, vegas could, yeah you could swap the uh, the driving you know yeah easily get there in uh, in a day so yeah dude let's go to vegas man i'll meet you there oh uh, I, I, I just I, I just i'd love to have somewhere just for times like this it, let's, it's, let's it's do actually, a let's do a mindset meetup in vegas yeah let's do it I, i'd uh I I'd think, be passed out somewhere. Uh, I think if you're going to move down there, I mean, more towards Garrett's way because you have more stuff to do. I mean, you're going to get bored of that after a while, I think. No, dude. You never, you never get bored in Vegas, dude. Because in California, oh, you got so much stuff to oh, do. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's, Vegas is like, uh, what, three and a half, four hours from here? Oh, okay. So, you know well, what? I, pretty- I know someone who went there, and then people said, well, what's it most? what does it most remind you of in the world? And they said, Blackpool. <laughs> Um, apparently, <laughs> the, the atmosphere is very similar. Yeah, I, I, I said, when I Blackpool first Blackpool and Las Vegas are very similar. Yeah, I used to think that too, man. When I first got here, I was like, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, right? There's like a Blackpool. guy I know called Ellis Taylor. He went to the Interna- the International UFO Congress. Used to be at Laughlin, Nevada. I think it's going back there actually. Right. And he um he went there. He, he did the sort because Area 51 is just north of there. Yeah. yeah. And so he, he did the like tour. He went to Eight Rachel and dropped another little alien, little alien and he went yeah. to the down Groom Lake Road and came back. Anyway, he went to the conference. It was, it was a two week conference. He came back and he got debagged at customs. Oh really? And um, he lost his luggage and everything. Oh shit. Oh yeah, TSA and 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 um, man, oh, that's trust, yeah, that scares the now. shit out of me, dude. Like like um, when tr- I mean, traveling is a pain in the ass as it is, right? You, you know, you're waiting around, you're stuck on an airplane for hours. It's tiring. It's you know, it's exhausting. It's it's a pain in the ass. But then to have to go through that nonsense too with these retards going through your fucking bags. I know. Oh, God, they did oh, more than that. God. I mean, they, he was basically he, he was walking funny for a couple of days. I don't know what they did to him. But... Really. No, I, I think he's, that's a slight hyperbole. But yeah. I mean, he was, they, he was told to turn out his pockets. He was, ta- he was felt. Fou- he sp- it could took a couple of hours. And um, I used to joke with him. I said they're just a bit angry because you you've achieved a negative ambition. You know, the only guy who went to Vegas and never put on a bet. <laughs> oh man, he, he just passed through there on the way to to Laughlin. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's the thing I don't like about um, the drive to Vegas. Actually, the border. Yeah, the border's the border. Border and and now I hear in the state, it's a lot. Sometimes they have a like actually. 
Like with uh, states have their own little border patrols or something. Dude, this like is that. fucking crazy. I mean, I talked about this on the show last year, probably when it happened to me. When I when I we were, we drove, uh, I think it was like August or uh, July or August of of twenty twelve of last year. We drove from uh, uh, from L A to San Antonio, Texas, and then back. Now on the way over, no problems, nothing. On the way back. Uh, when we got through, got to uh, New Mexico, and we went through the New Mexico border, the uh, we got pulled over by the fucking uh, border patrol. All right, and they, they stopped the car, and uh, and they're like, uh, uh, "Everyone, American citizen." And I remember that. And my wife's like, "Yeah, yeah," and I'm like, "No." Oh. And. and Okay, where, where are you from? Let me see your passport. Where, I'm like, Pat, what passport? What the fuck are you talking about? We're, 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 we're you know, a hundred miles you're from the fucking a, you're border. You're in, in a country, right? I'm like, I'm, yeah, I'm not leaving the United States. I'm not entering the United States. What fucking password? Get out of here! Um, but you know that didn't go down too well, and um, they questioned, and, uh, and all, all I could think of in my mind was, it would have been so much easier just to lie. Like if I said, "Yep, American," they, they were, I would have been out of there in half a fucking second. It's just, I, I find cool. that a strange concept. So for for me traveling to the states, that's my biggest downfall. I hate. I mean, if it, it ah, it just bugs the shit out of me. Yeah, it's just, it's just horrible. And I noticed because uh, I mean, I go back to, back and forth to the UK every couple of years. I used to go every year, but those days are gone. You know, funds and money and nonsense. But uh, every couple of years, I'll go back, and I, I see the progress. It's like um, now, when you enter the U.S. in, in any airport, the, the 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 TSA agent, the customs agents, they they have uh, when you go up to show your passport, they have um, webcams pointing at you, so they take a photograph of of you. Uh, so everyone who, who enters the the country through um, uh, you know the the customs thing, they they automatically take a photograph of your face and then index that with your passport, and no doubt run it through facial recognition and see what other nonsense you've been up to and all kinds of it, it, it's it's I'm telling you, dude, the fucking Nazi Germany would 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 immediately fucking come in their pants to get their hands on this shit. It is in, yeah, I mean, this is this thing. It's the technology that's available now means that a big brother state is just so much easier than it was at the time of the Nazis. Oh, I mean, of course. I mean, you know, you know, if you're stopped on the streets in Britain now, and Britain is one of the worst countries in, in the Western world for this, you're stopped on the streets in Britain now, the police will ask you for your passport. What? They'll ask to see your passport. What? I'm not kidding you. They do. You, there's films on YouTube with them Can doing that. Can I see your, uh, your passport, please, sir? They'll say, will they say, have you got any ID on you? And, and if you ask what kind, they'll say, well, like a passport? I mean, if, I, if they ever do that to me, I'll joke with them. And I'll say, well, I'm they not usually ask for your, uh, your license, right, Ben? Well, like, they so just they... say, they generally say, if you ask them what kind of ID, they'll just say, well, like a passport or something. And I'll, if they do that to me, I'm going to joke with them. And I'll say, well, no, mate, I'm, going, I'm just going down the shops. I'm not planning on traveling abroad. Yeah. They, oh, okay. they, they should just do it uh, universal, and when they stop, you just say, your papers, please. <laughs> it is, isn't you know, it? That, bitter. Yeah. Snap fingers. That's know. preparing bitter. Well, pretty soon they'll just scan a chip in your your hand or something. Yeah. Yes. that's. I think that's where this is leading, Joe. This is where I, it's I think people should just randomly start stopping cops and saying, uh, can I see your ID, please? Can I can I see uh, your identification that proves that uh, that costume you're wearing is legitimate? You know, you're not <laughs> you're not just some mental case. Then, you then this you'll you'll be on the six o'clock news, Gareth, if you do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who are they to tell? We should be questioning them, those fucks. Yeah, questioning mm. me? Get out of here! There's some great videos on YouTube of people who've been stopped by the police and they know what they're doing. And the, the, the policemen are completely disarmed. They're completely befuddled by it. They go and they say, "What's your name?" and things like that. And they'll say, "Well, am I obliged to answer that?" Yeah. And they'll say, well, well, let's see, where's your contract? And things like that. And the, the police manager's completely not leaving. It's, it's very befuddled. different. It's very they different have to let you here. go. They even arrest you and keep you in, in a cell for a few hours, and then you can get your head down and have a little bit of a sleep. Yeah. It's police very, cells yeah. these days are quite comfortable. It's very different over here, though, man. I've noticed. I mean, I've watched a lot of those videos in the U.K., too, where people get all crazy with the cops over there. And the cops in the U.K. are kind of like these kind of passive-aggressive retards. They're kind of like very. You go so before before they get violent, you really got to push their buttons. Like really got to get before they before they put the cuffs on you and drag you away. That ain't the case here in the U.S. 
Nice. They, 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 they will fuck you up in a heartbeat. Mm. So, so the, the, uh, the air of violence is a lot stronger over here. Um, if, if you question a cop over here and, and you got a bit of an attitude about you, be prepared to be dragged away and get the shit kicked out of you. Yeah. Apparently the worst place is Brazil because, I mean, in Brazil, they'll shoot you. Oh, um, this is why Jean-Charles de Menezes, he ran when he was in London because he – do you remember that time when the guy got shot by the police in London? Uh-uh. Jean-Charles de Menezes, he's a, he's a Brazilian living in London and the police – told him to stop this was soon after the bombings on the tube he ran like hell and they chased after him they, he got onto a tube train the police chased after him onto the train and they basically they just held him down and shot him oh, De- they shot him to death and uh, there's a big inquiry well the thing is in, in brazil if the police tell you to stop you do run because they will take you behind a parked car and just kill you that's the end of that yeah and they'll just say oh he slipped over and that's the yeah, exactly that's the end of it yeah, well, uh, speaking of, we, we kind of drifted into the, the whole cop thing, which is cool because I have a clip here. Uh, this this made the news uh, this week uh, over here in the U.S., which is, um, it's about uh, the LAPD. And for some reason, <laughs> they're having problems uh, filling their ranks. So so, so it, it turned out it, it's becoming like a... Uh, a kind of uh, recruitment. They they want people to become cops because nobody nobody's becoming cops. What a shocker! Have a listen to this. The Los Angeles Police Department is looking for more than a few good recruits, but it's having trouble finding them. New at six, Eyewitness News reporter Carlos Granda shows us why the department can't seem to fill its open positions. <laughs> This is an LAPD graduating class in May of this year. 37 new officers getting their diplomas. At that time, the department had reached its goal of 10,000 officers. Since then, the numbers are dropping. We need about 800 people a month to apply so that we can fill up our classes. We've had to skip a class or two just because we haven't been able to fill up those classes. The department is having trouble finding qualified applicants. There's a thorough background check, and obvious things like a criminal history will disqualify someone, but so can your credit history. And after the recession, that affects more and more applicants. And people that aren't able to handle their credit or for one reason or another ended up getting into some kind of debt. Until they get that straightened out, that's, a, that's a generally a disqualifier. And there is more competition for good applicants. As the economy improves, other agencies are also hiring, and some pay more than the LAPD. But even those agencies, however, say it's tough. We go through thousands of applicants to get down to even uh, 100 people. So it, it is not an easy thing, even when you're being successful. For several years, the city has seen a dramatic reduction in crime. But officials wonder what could happen if there were fewer officers in the streets. Maybe a little bit slower response times in some of the neighborhoods. Maybe just not quite as many people as they have out there in the police cars. And officials worry that the longer this goes on now, it will be harder to catch up in the future. And they worry there could be a shortage of officers for years to come. Reporting from downtown Los Angeles, I'm Carlos Granda, ABC7 Eyewitness News. So they they kind of painting a picture that, uh, you know, we... uh attendance is down uh we need people to to sign up and become cops um you know and then they throw in the threat like well response time will be down and blah 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 and crime and well you know if you want to end crime then just make the economy good right because affluent people are less likely to go out and start shit that was a good point too how you brought that together how they mentioned that about the well the the response time will be slower you know we need you to apply yeah right and and I don't know what I don't I don't know whether this is an accurate story or not. It might be, but the feeling I get is like you know I mean they're just running out of fucking bullies and psychopaths. You know well, that's that's a good sign. I mean it it didn't it wasn't the, the story the the clip wasn't quite clear about whether it was simply a lack of applications or a lack of qualified applicants because they said yeah, that, yeah. they said some things that quite surprised me, Gareth. Like your credit rating is actually sure. can stop you getting in the police. And that well that counts me out anyway. Luckily, well the, the, <laughs> but, reason, the uh, reason the credit rating is is because if you have bad credit, credit and you're in a lot of debt uh the chances of you getting up to some shenanigans and and uh you know taking some cash or doing some nonsense is far greater than somebody who has no money worries i guess that's true yeah but i mean that in in, in that case the, the the reason is simpler because so many uh, there's very very few people now who actually have a clean credit rating i can't well there's many i know yeah, yeah many companies do that too though they, they do check your credit yeah the, the bin makes a good point that uh but since the economy, 
it's definitely changed. Has anyone is there is there anyone you guys know who's ever missed a payment on a loan or things like who's never missed a payment on the loan uh, on things like that? Because I, I can't think of anybody who hasn't had a nasty letter because they've had to drop a payment. Yeah. I don't know. And that's, so that is, as you said, Gareth, it's the financial and economical situation that is causing this. And as you, you said, this, it's, it's a double whammy because it stops – obviously, it makes people's lives more difficult. It makes the, – the temptation to get into right. crime of is course. bigger. I mean, when, when you look at crime-infested areas where everyone's like up to no good and drugs and stealing, you know, it's an area that's economically deprived, right? It's an area where there's not much money. Always, always. High, it's it's a completely it's it's a complete correlation. Poverty equals high crime rate. Exactly. Affluent areas, low crime rate. Right. So if, if my they're... my concern is how many cops go into those areas anyway? It's like uh, you know the, the poverty crime stricken areas. Those are the areas I think the cops avoid. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see what you mean. Yeah, they they would tend to kind of skirt around those. You know, I mean, I mean, they do go there. Uh, in those areas, I, yeah, I, I've I've driven through there and seen police cars patrolling and and shit like that. Um, but but yeah, it's to, it's totally economics. You know, they want more cops. What do you need more cops for? You, well, you need more cops to keep the maniacs in line, right? For the people who are out there stealing and acting stupid and all that nonsense. So you need more cops to keep them in line. But if that money was better spent in making those areas more affluent, where they would have jobs and money and blah blah blah. Then the cops, you wouldn't need them, right? That certainly that certainly worked in in in, in Oxford. I mean, in Oxford, a lot of the sort of high crime areas, these were the various council estates on the edges of the city. I mean, they they were they're now much easier and safer places to go because what basically one place called Blackbird Lees was a complete hellhole for a while, and there was massive riots there a few years ago, and then they basically they they instead of sending more police in there due to to sort of have more and more suppression of and law enforcement, what they did instead was they put a college there, they put in nice ornamental gardens, they put in some new shops, they put in a, uh, an apprentice um, training college and things like that. And now it's it's, it's 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 done the trick. It's worked. Yeah, things are things are a lot better there now than they used to be. Yeah, I mean every city is the same though. I mean every city you can you go to, there are certain areas that are economically deprived and uh you know you you you, uh, you don't go there especially after dark right because you know there's going to be people up to no good um not because these people are evil or mean or nasty it's because that's the culture that's the way they were raised they're raised with nothing uh and the culture is constantly enforcing to them oh you got to have this you got to have that you got to have the latest this you get you know, all this nonsense so they're, they're well I, well i i got no money I got no job. I'm not the smartest guy on the planet. How the fuck am I going to get this shit? Well, I'll just go take it. You know? And, that, and that's where the nonsense begins. Yeah. Now, that, Sounds just like government to me. They just go in and take it. So. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's uh, not this to say that, that rich, affluent areas don't have crime also. Of course they do. Sure. But they have a different kind of crime. They're kind, I'm personally, they're, I'm glad to hear that the uh, that they're having trouble finding people. Yeah, the, if people yeah. aren't applying, and um, you know, uh, I'm thinking. But then I think, who doesn't have a bad credit rating or at one time or another in their life, or well, especially right now? Of course. I, 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 I so I'm surprised. I I know that the police in Canada do the same thing. You have to have a like an A one credit rating and. Uh, but if look at this though, dude. I mean, I, I mean, I've said this many times before, and I still stand by it. Why would a, a, a normal, intelligent, rational, logical person want to become a, a police officer? How, how, this is how, 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 yeah. how does that happen? How, what, what, how does a, just a, a regular guy who's not like a maniac, not a bully, not a fucking uh, authoritarian prone fucking mental case, just a normal person? What's the likelihood of them getting into law enforcement? Well, it's fucking zero. Usually it's yeah. because someone in your family's already been in it. If you you know you grow up and that's what you want to do, it's uh, like the mate. Well, that's a good point, Joe, because you're bringing up the, the the sort of nepotism and the old boy network and maybe the Freemasons as well and um, things like that. But other than that, it's usually military too. You know, someone that comes back from the military, that's what they'll do. Well, or the, the, going joining the military, uh, it, it usually usually the military will fall into a few categories. It's either like 
uh, e- economically deprived neighborhoods, right? So you you just you've just got out of school. Um, there's no jobs where you live. Uh, it's economically deprived. You don't know what to do with your life. Uh, you got little to no money. Suddenly, there's that the the fucking the the army recruitment office where they'll take you away for five or six years, pay you, feed you, train you, and you're like, fuck it. <laughs> what have I got to lose? Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's, so it's... so you sign up. So that's one kind of people, and I think that kind of person for the military. Uh, kind of uh, encompasses the majority. Okay, yeah, great point on that. Right, I think most of the people that join the military are doing it because of, of what I just described. Now, the other kind is, you know, you're you're a bit mental. There's something not right with you. You're obsessed with guns and authority, and you like shooting stuff, and, and you're not 100% in the head, and you're gravitated towards that stuff. Yeah, either that or things like like uh, security work, bouncers, yeah, um, part you know, car, uh, traffic warden, right, prison warder, things like that. I mean, I, I was talking before about the guys I know at school who were the bullies. All of them, almost all of them, are now traffic wardens. They're nightclub <laughs> bouncers. They're bailiffs. Yeah, because you know, you're, all of them you're, because you're 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 a terrified little child inside, and you you you've gotten used to wearing the big tough guy mask. That you you gravitate towards these kind of imbecile jobs, you know, to be where you can legitimately push people around and belittle people and tell them what to do and get violent and all that stuff that's deeply embedded in your psyche that you love to do. Because I mean, what what regular, normal, rational person would would would, would want to do any of these jobs? Nobody. Well, this is it. I mean, I, it's it's a hard thing because, but there are people. There are people. I mean, they've just recently done tests on psychopaths, and they found it's not just about being the kind of person who who has no conscience, is amoral, but they actually get, they actually enjoy. There actually is a sadistic element yeah. of psychopaths. They actually they actually go out of their way to make life um, unpleasant for other people sure, for the sake sure. of it. Yeah, yeah, I've known I've known people like that. There's people. There's people I know um, very close to me who've been like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think uh, I mean the, the, the psychopathic uh, you know uh, mentality. It, I mean, it, in the vast majority of people, it's still a tiny minority. Um, you know, they are they're outnumbered like a million to one or whatever. But the people that are involved that have this kind of uh, mental illness, uh, they do gravitate to those kind of jobs, and they also gravitate to jobs where they can control and manipulate people legitimately. Where if you control someone. It's not looked down upon. It's looked at like, hey, this guy's on the ball. Look at this guy. So they're gravitated to, you know, a position like um, supervisors, managers, um, you know, heads of companies, heads of state, politics, things of that nature. So all these people who are legitimately, legitimately mentally ill, right, who have a very serious mental condition, uh, they they are the ones who are corralling and controlling the majority of people the sad thing is i mean it's the sad thing is that they they gravitate towards pa- positions of power because right. the the kind of people who really ought to be in power are the kind of people who don't seek it exactly this is a, this is... exactly. exactly exactly you know i i've noticed that I'm, I'm relating this to my work history and it always seems to me that the managers and supervisors are the the, the i go how did they get in that position because I look at other people and go, man, they should be the manager because they're the people <laughs> out front leading us, sure, sure. not sitting behind a desk whipping us. I, I, I often wonder how do people get put in those positions. Yeah. I, it, it blows me away. Well, there's, there's well that it can be crap. But being crap at your job is a good way. So there's certainly in my hospital, the people who are utterly useless as porters always end. Well, firstly, they were good at kissing ass. They were, yeah. they were good at you know impressing the <laughs> boss for the sake of it. They were also willing to grass up other members of staff, untrustworthy. They were crap at their job, and that's a perfect ingredient for a manager because they can't just can't do anything else with you, basically. Yeah, control and kiss ass. You said that that's exactly what it is. Right. Oh yeah, there was this guy it's... who's well, he, his name's Roy. He doesn't listen to this show, so he doesn't mind me saying this. But he was absolutely notorious for it. He would be, firstly, he was he, was, he really was a very unpleasant individual. He was nasty to people who could get away with being nasty to. He was uh, incompetent and and completely in, irresponsible in terms of his job. Right, and well, well, um, to get a, to the get, moment to make it fair and balanced, Ben, l- let me just bring Roy on. Roy, what do you have to say about what Ben just said? <laughs> 
I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> did your heart no, stop? Did your heart no, skip no. a beat for a second there, Brent? Serve me right. <laughs> serve me right. Yeah. Um, well, it's not his real name anyway. I, I know. Say that. <laughs> his real name's John. Uh, but but uh, there's an old saying: uh, anyone who seeks power should not be allowed to get it. Right. But in this day and age, those people are getting it. I think. Oh, of course, yeah, they're they're yeah. yeah. But when you but just think about that: anyone who seeks power should not be allowed to get it. Because power is not the, not not the means to the end, right? You, you, people should be in that position because uh, they care, because they're now, do, they're doing it to to make it better for the people uh, around them. Whereas the people that gravitate to powerful positions, they do it to make things better for them. I mean, if you heard of the Stanford Prison Experiment, yes, yeah, it's it's absolutely terrifying. It's a terrifying situation because yeah. they they basically these completely ordinary people put into this situation right. turned into monsters. Exactly, yeah. And this is this is how they managed to f- they they could run things like FEMA camps. This is how they got the gulag sure, orders. Yeah, pe- most people will just just do it. They'll just go along with it, and they would torture each other psychologically. I mean, the problem is everyone in our society. Um, is in some way psychologically tortured, right? Because everything, everything around us in the media, in our lives, is designed to to break our spirit. Exactly. And um, you know, when you but you know things like dogs. I mean, you put dogs. Dogs are wonderful creatures. They get along really, really well. They're friendly to humans and friendly to each other. You you lock them up in a cage together, and they'll tear each other apart. Give them a few months of being locked in a cage together. They'll be tearing each other apart. And any person takes them out for a walk, he'll kill them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's the same. They, you know, they do these experiments, uh, like you know, to train for long uh, space missions and stuff. You know, they put a bunch of people together because they know that you know, pe- uh, people confined in a small area for a long period of time. I mean, they could go in there being the best of friends on the planet, you know, and then uh, six months later, they're they're ready to kill each other. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's this TV show, Big Brother, which is. Yeah. I mean, what they do on these long space missions like uh, Mir and the and the International Space Station, they 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 psychologically analyze people to check that they're going to get along and they're not going to break down. With Big Brother and reality TV, it's the exact opposite. They put people together they know are going to they, they want stir people, up yeah. they want trouble, they sure, want fighting, sure. they want they conflict. Want now, I want to kind of stay with the whole police um, vibe for a little bit because I have another clip here, which. Uh, which is squarely aimed at Trevor, and I want—I really, I want to. Obviously, I want to get everyone's opinion on this piece, but but especially Trevor's. So, um, apparently, up in Canada, there's a, there's a Royal Canadian um, Mounted Police officer who likes to smoke a little weed, um, and uh, issues have arisen. Let's let's have a quick listen to this. Bit of an unusual story now. An RCMP officer says he should be allowed to smoke medicinal marijuana in public while in uniform. Ron Francis uses pot to help his symptoms of PTSD. The RCMP says it's fine that he uses it, has even allowed him to use it at work. But Francis says that's not enough. Evan Dyer has the story. There's one fatality. Corporal Ron Francis has 21 years service under his belt. And in that time, he's seen plenty of death and plenty of tragedy. I still am plagued uh, by flashbacks to this day uh, of wiping brains from my boot every time I see a black doormat. Uh, that's called a trigger. Francis also spent time in the Labrador community of Davis Inlet, where children were filmed sniffing gas. The work took its toll, and he was eventually diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. RCMP didn't provide the treatment uh, for PTSD, and I, and I thank the RCMP for that. But Francis says he didn't find the treatment that helpful, so he went to his own physician, who earlier this month gave him a prescription for three grams of marijuana a day, about 9 to 15 joints. The the treatment works very well, uh, keeps him very uh, on a level, uh, allows me to concentrate. um, So uh, it works very well for me. The RCMP says it's okay with an officer using medical marijuana while on duty, but it reserves the right to limit an officer's functions, such as driving a car or carrying a gun. Francis is already on administrative duty, but the RCMP remains very concerned about the optics. Definitely a member uh, that has been prescribed medicinal marijuana should not be in red surge uh, taking his medication. Uh, It would not be uh, advisable for that member. It would not portray the right uh, message uh, to the general public. Uh, It's definitely not something that we would uh, support or condone. But as this home video shows, it is something that Francis has done. 
There is no policy that prevents me as a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police from smoking marijuana. I do have the legal right to, to smoke it in my red surge. That is not a conduct that is becoming uh, a, a person who wears that uniform. Uh, while he's in uniform, while he's on duty, uh, he should not be doing that. Tonight, the RCMP moved to make sure it wouldn't happen again. Officers visited Francis at home in New Brunswick and took away his uniforms. It was hard. Uh, you know, I, I broke down crying. Um, I, I was in a ball. In the My sister had to come down uh, and console me. The Mounties missed the one uniform that the RCMP wanted most. Francis's iconic red surge was at his girlfriend's house, but he's been ordered in writing to hand it in by noon tomorrow. Evan Dyer, CBC News. Ottawa. An estimated 37,000 Canadians are licensed medical marijuana users. Health Canada's marijuana for medical purposes regulations do not lay out where a licensed user may use the drug. But users do have to follow federal and provincial laws as well as local bylaws around smoking in public places. Well, there you have it. I mean, I I have some uh, some definite thoughts about this case, but uh, I really want to get Trevor's take on it. So, Trevor, what, what's what's your vibe on this? Oh, I was I'm really pissed off when I heard this. Uh, yeah, you know, I, if I'm if I'm outside smoking, um, this this cop could go smoke weed and then come down and arrest me for doing the same thing he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 then now then now a little bit of uh, background like the RCMP. Um, I'm everyone's familiar with the FBI in the states. The RCMP are comparable to the FBI. They're a federal okay. agency. Uh, RCMP are are big into like the fraud and the, the you know the the drugs and whatnot. Like right. the, um, they're they're huge in Canada. And and when they talk about a red surge, that's you know the red uh, uniform, right, the black right. pants and. Um, he's he was caught. Uh, he was video recorded smoking weed. Well, in that the uh, the red uh, RCMP uniform. So, yeah, I, I I have major issues with this. The hypocrisy of government just it makes me sick. Um, you know, you or I were standing on my deck having a joint, just relaxing. A cop can come walk around and then throw us in jail. But this guy on the job, he's a he's allowed to smoke joints know, and and. For, Three grams a day? How is this guy mm. even making it out of bed to get into work? <laughs> like this, three and, grams a day, that's a lot of weed. Now, uh, yeah, I am familiar with it. So I know that three grams, um, I, I'd be like, okay, this is basically my day off. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not, that's all I'm going to do today. I mean, three grams, that's, it's a you, lot. you're, you're passed out. I, I mean, yeah. um, this guy's been smoking weed a long time for his life. To be prescribed three grams a day, he's obviously been doing it for Many years. Many years. Yeah. And, and it, this is what pisses me off about police is that, that they do something – and it's a, it's a schedule one or two in Canada. Like it's, it's, it's not as, as um, bad in the States. Canada's a bit more relaxed on it. But still, if a cop wants to throw me down for uh, – you know, I got a couple grams of weed in my pocket and put me in jail for a few years. It can happen in Canada. Right, right. So, so, you know, anyways, it's, it's, it's hypocrisy on a, a major level. No, I, I agree. I mean, my uh, my my feeling on this is that all right, the guy's got some some issues, job related issues. So you you uh, you, f you fire him, or, or you get him to retire, and you give him some uh, pension or something, so he can stay at home and smoke his weed and stare at the wall. You you don't put him on active duty and have him smoking his pot, right? Uh, he sh he shouldn't be doing the job he's doing. He should be let go. Yeah, and to, to be doing it exactly uh, uh, in his uniform out in public, like, and tre that's what aggravates Trevor. It sounds like is the hypocrisy because he's he can arrest you for the same thing, but for him, it's medical medical use, so it's allowed. Yeah, it's crazy, right? What do you? What's your take, Ben? What's your take on the uh, the mounted police uh, smoking a joint? Oh, well, there's several different issues here which bother me, and. Um, and I think I agree with what what um, you and Joe were saying, Gareth. That um, we're dealing with a guy basically who should be um, he should get a, a medical discharge from his job. Yeah. I mean, he's he's obviously he's traumatized by what he's had to do in the course of his police force. Many other people are too, and we hear all all the time about this happening to the military. But mil the military are not the only people who have to suffer in this way, and and it's not not even all the police either. With nurses and doctors and people who work in hospitals 
often experience this kind of trauma, and it's generally ignored. So that's another thing I can have a rant about. Yeah. Um, but um, and we used to say about the midwives at my hospital, they're all crazy. Anyone who'd been there more than two years would just go crazy from PTSD. But um, the, the point of the matter is, I get the feeling this guy is essentially being punished for for doing his duty in a way because of what happens. He's basically doing what he's doing because of what happened. That's the first issue. He, he's continuing in service. They want to keep him on as a working police officer, and he's taking measures through so through his doctor to do that. Well, and then, then they they're saying. That, why, why? They basically have this very ignoble, dishonorable kind of treatment why would of him. They, why would they want to keep him on, keep him doing that job? I mean, it's obvious he's got some uh, some mental issues from dealing with nonsense, right? He, he's, mm. It's obvious that he's going through some shit. Why not do the right thing and say, look, we understand, you know, this is what's going on. We're going to put you on leave or, or retire you early, give you X amount of dollars a month yeah. for a pension, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But uh, you're done. Yeah, he's he's done his duty. He's done a grand duty. Give him his pension. Let him let him go. Well, we, we, don't, that, we don't know whether he's done a grand duty, Ben. I mean, this guy might might have been a, a, a thieving, retard, imbecile, piece of shit cop. We, we no, <laughs> yeah, we don't true. know. But this this might help uh, chill cops mm. out, though. This might be good for them. You you uh, it, it, the story illustrated about uh, post traumatic stress syndrome and uh, how I mean, they, and, and, this this is yeah. this is used for it. So maybe well, that's why issue. he's doing it. Because in this country, it'd be very, very different. In this country, you do not touch it. You, you're not allowed. I mean, you, it's still, it's still a, registered. It's, I mean, they've changed the law slightly, but still, you are not allowed to have it on. You're not allowed to carry it around with you. If you sell it, it's a very serious offence to deal it. Um, now, now, this is this comes back to the government's general attitude on drugs, which is really, really quite. Um, un, it's really one of the stupidest things that governments do, and I think that one of the most sinister things that they do is their double standards and the various um, strange attitude they have towards drugs. On the one hand, you're allowed to consume tobacco. Tobacco is legal. Alcohol is legal. These are drugs which are taxable. Yeah. They make they make the government a lot of money, and they have very, very little benefit. They don't really have any beneficial effect on people. I mean, right. some people say they, they have, they, there's some argument to say they have a beneficial effect. But there's... Um, Basically, they have a lot of ill effects. I mean, alcohol k- kills more people than, than wars. It kills more people than traffic accidents. It kills and, and smoking as well. I mean, there's cancer deaths from smoking, things like that. Um, now, marijuana is, is is an ancient herb that's been used for since prehistoric times, and it's it's been used all wherever it grows all around the world, just like many other of these natural herbs do. Uh, and it has it's. People who use it get a lot of pleasure from it, and it it seems to have a very beneficial effect on their personality. And their, I mean, people who are you who use it seem to be a lot more easygoing. They seem to be a lot nicer. They seem to they seem to enjoy their life more. And they said this does help me enjoy my life. Right, but we don't want people want running around the place enjoying their lives. Come Goodness, on, man. no. I mean, you know, it's like Bill Hicks, you know, Bill Hicks talks about he, he he talks about LSD as well, but he talks about pot as well, and yeah. he says. Yeah, what's wrong with why they want to ban, why they want to ban pot for? I mean, pot's wonderful, and he and he says well, that's why they want that's why they want to ban it because it's so wonderful. Well, he, he also so they want to ban he, anything that's good. He talks about that whole thing too. Like if you're, uh, I mean, if you're at a sports game and people have been drinking, you know, the air of violence and and yeah. issues and, and is is escalated. But if you're at a sports game where everyone's smoking pot. There's, there's no violence or, or nonsense or, or, or aggravation. That, that, that's a Pink Floyd concert. <laughs> but yeah, but you, know, but you know what I mean. It's like if you if you give someone you know a, a bottle of whiskey and you give another guy you know a, a three grams of, of pot and they both you know drink and eat one guy drinks and the other guy smokes, which one of those guys is more prone to be violent and a pain in the ass? Every every day of the week and twice on Sundays, it'll be the drunk guy because alcohol does of alcohol course. has it has it, it releases your inhibitions. It makes you aggressive. Right. It's it can it make you sad. It has. I mean, I've been drunk a few times. I mean, I've not been aggressive when I'm drunk, but I've been sad and I've been all these kind of things. Yeah. And, it, and you get this horrible hangover in the morning. It makes you ill. It poisons you. Um. But I mean, the thing about um. I mean, Bill Hicks talked about LSD, but I mean, it's it, when you talk about LSD, this is another class A drug that's banned. And he says, I lay in a field, I mean, the same with magic mushrooms and things like that. Yeah. You lay in a field, you have these psychedelic spiritual experiences where you're connected to the divine. And Bill Hicks says, uh, he describes these experiences about a man realizing, you know, we're all one yeah. consciousness. Yeah, right. We're all experiencing <laughs> ourselves subjectively. Yeah. Life's just a dream. And then the government come along and they say, well, right, we want to go and drop some bombs on these people over in this country over here. Yeah. And he says, what well, if everyone's, everyone has been had these experiences, they're going to say, no way, no. Right. right. 
And so that's why they ban it. Yeah. Because they don't want people having these insights. Because they want people sure. to hate others and drop bombs on them. Or 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 be completely oblivious to everything. Um, but yeah, yeah you're I mean, absolutely, if you're drunk, you're having a problem. You go, oh yeah, well, you'll be drinking. Oh yeah, so drop you, uh, them bombs on them fucking bastards. I don't care. <laughs> you know. It's, so you legalize the drugs that that uh, that you can tax heavily that are addictive, but has have no real benefit at all. And the drugs that maybe aren't so addictive but have enormous beneficial, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, easing pain or uh, expanding consciousness or whatever the case may be, those are made uh, completely illegal and uh, exactly. pu punishable by uh, severe jail time penalties. Exactly. I'll tell you what, I bet everyone's had this experience, okay? You, 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 get, you either have to do it yourself or someone else does it to you, and that is apologize to somebody else for something you did while you were pissed when you were drunk. <laughs> yes. Right. Oh, and, yeah. and now how many – I know many, many people to, who are – no one has ever – who I know who takes marijuana has ever had to – I mean, I've only ever been stoned once in my life, and it was wonderful, and I, we had a wonderful time. But no one – I've known – I've seen people <laughs> who are stoned, and not once have any of them ever done anything that they need to right. apologize to me for. No, I, I would agree. I would agree. I mean, you, you've constantly run into people who are who who drink and they're they're violent fucking maniacs, you know. But when you run into someone who's smoked out, they're they're like just just mellow. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, not There's to no not issues. to mention the fact that people who drink heavily often have problems. They they lose brain cells. They have their liver gets screwed up. Yeah. Their stomach line, the stomach wall lining breaks down. Them then they get cancer in your know, mouth and your throat and and all these other health problems which you get from from drinking That's heavily. Fucking crazy. All right, any any final comments on the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, pot smoking dude who was crying like a, like a little bitch because they took his costume away? I was just going to say, um, he actually gets away with a lot, it seems like. They let him do it at the job. Like He seems like he's just pushing the boundaries, you know? Yeah. I don't know. It's I'm, interesting I'm high story. right now, so I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, yeah, it just, I heard it and it, it, it you know, yes, obviously, I, I, I can't imagine, you know, I can. I, I've seen, I've seen some, you know, I worked in a morgue for two years. So, yeah, I had to take babies down. Um, I wasn't. You know, no yeah. one came to me and said, "Hey, would you like to smoke three grams during your shift?" I'd be like, yeah, "Yeah, but I'm not going to be able. I'm not going to do anything. I might as well just sit in the office and sleep yeah. on the couch." So, yeah. you know, it just but the hypocrisy because this guy can go down the road and then handcuff someone and uh -huh. say and 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 end their life. Oh, you just had a baby? Oh, tough, tough shit. You're going to go to jail for two years and 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 forget about getting a job when you get out. You you be you'd be lucky to get a job at Walmart for Christ's sake. Like, so it just. I hear things like that, and I mean the government's trying to put it under the carpet, sweep it under there so quick right now. Um, the guy did, by the way, hand in his um, his mount the uniform. He handed that in by noon. Oh, so they, by they, noon, they, they handed in. They did the get big it. They did get it. Get their hands on that one. He he I'll did. Uh, he did hand it in. Um, and in Canada, that's a big thing. When you retire, you have to hand that in. In fact, I had a neighbor yeah. who um, had to burn his. <laughs> they, they had to actually uh, oh, had fuck. someone come out uh, from the RCMP, and they 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 okay, they 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 burn it. The, oh, you can't yeah, can't he, can he just can he just go to like the the fucking uh, costume rental store and just buy a, a new fucking one? I don't know. I'll tell you what, like I don't know <laughs> if you get yeah. one out here. You uh, know, if if. Like, if Sorry, sorry. I was going to say that if LAPD allowed new recruits to smoke dope, this might solve the recruitment problem we were talking about earlier. <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> I, I think a lot of problems. I think a lot of problems would be solved with uh, if more people got high. Yeah. Some of these poli you know. Well, they, they do. The politicians do. Trust me. Oh yeah. You, you, dude, you know how many and times? And that's the thing. That's why I, I, I think that that. You know, I've said it before. I mean, government laws are nothing more than opinions backed up with guns. Of course. <laughs> How many it's times just... have politicians been busted with coke and fucking hookers and all kinds of nonsense? It's constant. I mean, all of them are up to it. What is this? That dude? Who's, who's that guy? That uh, that fat guy that was on TV? The the mayor of some shit. Oh yeah, that, Rob Ford. Oh, yeah. That guy was just smoking fucking crack. He was up to all kinds of bullshit. And everyone yeah. was all, oh, I'm outraged, I'm outraged. And I'm like, what are you outraged for? He's just someone who got caught. All the others are doing it behind closed doors? Come on. Yeah, but the thing is, everybody does it. I, you know, everybody's got, you know, 
I, I don't know. It just – this is of where government course, laws dude. bug me because it's like you know we're going to make a law saying this is illegal. Meanwhile, the guy's going to go back and let, blow let me, let me ask Ben. I, let, me, his ass. let me ask Ben. Ben, can you – in your mind's eye, can you picture Osborne and Cameron snorting fucking cocaine? Well, I think uh, one of their Bullingdon Club meetings, they, they did all the time. But um, I, I bet you anything they, they get up to it now. Absolutely. Anything, anything. No question they're doing it. So, yeah, they're all doing it. It's just, you know, it's just levels, right? You know, they can get away with that shit. And even if they do get caught, they can get out of it, right? They they got the money, the lawyers, and the, the power to say, all right, you didn't see that. If you pursue this, you're out of a job. And the cop will be like, see what? Yeah? And that's the end of that. Boom. All right, let's take a break, shall we? Let's let's get this this the police force and the drugs and all that stuff. Let's get it out of our minds. Uh, but, I, I got to go hide mine. <laughs> but I am gonna say, smoke them if you got them. We'll be right back. <laughs> Mindset Daily, hosted by Joe Dunn, a twice weekly and sometimes daily wrap-up on the current news of the strange. Every episode will highlight and comment on news stories that have either not made it into the mainstream or just grabbed our attention. Mindset Daily, your bite-sized alternate news fix. You can listen to Mindset Daily at MindsetCentral.com. Mindset Daily. You're listening to the Mindset Network. You can now hear all of the Mindset Central podcasts while on the go with the Stitcher Smart Radio app. On-demand news, talk, and more on your mobile phone. The latest episodes at Mindset Central are always available for you. No syncing needed and no memory or storage wasted. Available on your iPhone, iPad, Android phones and beyond. Downloading is easy. Go to Stitcher.com or check out your app store. Stitcher Smart Radio. The smarter way to listen to MindsetCentral.com. you 
back. Hope you like that one. That was uh, Mansions and Flowers in My Teeth. Tell us a little bit about those guys, Joe. Yeah, that's um, Mansions. That's off their recent album called Doom Loop. It's a band out of Seattle. And you can check them out at thisismansions.com. And I played their, that, that song right there, Flowers in My Teeth, which I like a lot. It was on the last episode of the Mindset Radio Hour, which you can get at mindsetcentral.com. Take your mind off things, listen to some music for a while. Yeah, check it out. That, that's, that kind of music is indicative to the Mindset uh, Radio Hour. So please check it out. Some great tunes, some great uh, chat with, uh, with Joe. Um, great show. So have a listen. All right, guys, where do we go from here? We've talked cops. We've talked pot. Let's talk the big news story this week um, was the death of South Africa's uh, President Nelson Mandela. Uh, He died a couple of days ago. Worldwide headlines, you know, the world over Uh, South Africa in um, in mourning due to the the death of this uh this man i have a a clip here uh from uh, the local la news here where they talk about it a little bit so i'd like to play that and then we'll get into some commentary about uh mandela himself his legacy and what he did for south africa um and the world here we go Nelson Mandela made it his life's mission to fight for freedom and equality and his ability to forgive inspired millions how it is news reporter Alex Michelson begins our team coverage tonight with more on Mandela's impact. Alex? Well, David, speaking of forgiveness, you may remember this. Nelson Mandela invited his own jailers to sit in the front row during his inauguration as he was sworn in as South Africa's president. Like his heroes, Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. before him, Nelson Mandela practiced nonviolent activism. And like Gandhi and Dr. King, he was a man who changed the world. Here's evidence of his impact in South Africa. This is a live picture from Pretoria, South Africa, just outside his home. It's about 4 o'clock in the morning there, but that isn't stopping what is a celebration of his life. News first came down around midnight, and the the songs of Mandela and his uh, tribal name Madiba have not stopped until then. Of course, news of his death, not exactly a surprise at age 95, but when you think about his life, it doesn't make it any less remarkable. Nelson Mandela's life is being celebrated outside his Pretoria home by a grateful people. Our nation has lost its greatest son. Our people have lost a father. F.W. de Klerk, the white leader who helped free Mandela and later shared a Nobel Peace Prize with him, describes him this way. Nelson Mandela's biggest legacy was his commitment to reconciliation. As a young man, Mandela fought against South Africa's apartheid system, which discriminated against the black majority. The Africans require, want the franchise on the basis of one man, one vote. In 1964, he was sent to prison for his activism. I have cherished the idea of a democratic and free society. It is an idea for which I am prepared to die. South Africans rallied to free Mandela and end apartheid. The government has taken a firm decision to release Mr. Mandela unconditionally. After 27 years, Mandela finally walked free in 1990 and then took his message to the U.S. To deny any person their human rights is to challenge their very humanity. Thank you so very much. He even visited Los Angeles' City Hall and Exposition Park. With you on our side, we are certain of victory. In 1994, became South Africa's first black man elected president. And instead of retribution, he encouraged reconciliation with the white minority. The birthday boy, Nelson Mandela. Post-retirement, his activism continued. In 2000, he met with schoolchildren here in Los Angeles. When the World Cup was hosted in his South Africa in 2000, Mandela took center stage. In his later years, his health was failing, but his ability to inspire was not. He'd host leaders from around the world, including the Obama family. For now, let us pause and give thanks for the fact that Nelson Mandela lived. 
a man who took history in his hands and bent the arc of the moral universe towards justice. May God bless his memory and keep him in peace. Just last night was the London premiere of a new film called Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom. Mandela's two youngest daughters were inside the theater watching the screening. When they were told about his death, they immediately left. The entire country of South Africa will now observe 10 days of official mourning. Reporting live from the newsroom, Alex Michelson, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Alex, thank you. So, I mean... Uh that kind of um, that that clip gave like a, an overview, of, albeit a very brief one, of uh, Mandela's life and um, political struggle. Um, but there's a lot of stuff going on here that that does have conspiratorial elements to it, and uh, I'm hoping that we can get into it a little bit uh, because on this show, you know, we can delve into areas that uh, other shows or other people in conversation might think about but but wouldn't necessarily verbalize in you know in in, in polite company <laughs> um so i want to ask ben first because i know that, that that ben you you were um very much uh opinionated in regard to uh nelson mandela um yeah so let, let's let's start with you what, what are your thoughts on this well, I mean, I did. I wrote, I actually written an obituary to Mandela. I also made a little video <coughs> obituary to him as well about him. Because, um, but the thing is, I drafted the obituary quite a long time ago. I actually drafted the obituary back in, I think it was, it was in August when he first got ill, when he first became seriously ill. And he, we were told he was taken into hospital with a, a lung problem. Right. And we were told he'd slipped into a coma and basically everyone thought he was a goner. Then we hear uh, there's no news at all. He gets taken home in an ambulance where he's been cared for at home, which is no, but it's not easy to do when he's in intensive care. Well, um, there's more. Then, uh, there's more to it than that, though, Ben, because I remember mm. hearing reports, news reports, around that time, that uh, that he had died. Yeah, this is what I think happened. I suspect he's actually been dead for a while. Right. And I, what I suspect they've done is they've basically covered up his death. Well, they haven't covered up his death. What they've said is they, they've delayed the announcement for a very, very long time until a, a, a moment they think is right. Exactly. And it's not necessarily to do with the premiere of the movie. I think that's probably a, a bonus. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's probably a, 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 a perk. I think a the, the, the real reasons are probably very different. The primary I, I agree, reasons I agree, aren't. yeah. But I mean, the the reason is because basically because he, he was he's such a popular man. I mean, to, to, the scenes in South Africa right now are like unbelievable for someone in my country and probably most people in America too. You would never ever see such an outpouring of grief over the death of one of our statesmen. No. Course, in some cases, it's the opposite. In case of, in the case of Margaret Thatcher, people were celebrating. Yeah, there was yeah. a woman who there's a woman who'd been keeping champagne in her fridge since 1986 as a bottle of champagne waiting for the for day her, uh, when and they filmed her popping the cork and drinking it yeah. when she died. Uh, Mandela, he, he was without a doubt the most popular man that that country has ever known. And um, th now what's going to happen I mean, I'm, without him? Actually, I, I, I've got some concerns about what's going to happen to that country without him. Mm. Because the, the, the fact, his greatest triumph, because I mean, he's one of the few world leaders I've ever felt any real admiration for. And his greatest triumph was because when, when the apartheid system collapsed, everyone was think everyone was expecting that South Africa to dissolve into a civil war, which may, which may result in some kind of fascist dictator taking power like Mugabe in, in Zimbabwe had, which would probably mean that the white South Africans would be exterminated. They'd either be, they'd either be well, kicked out of the country, dispossessed, or killed. Well, ben, the, the, and Mandela came, Mandela came along, like, as, as that news report said. He says, no, no, don't take revenge. Don't, we don't want any more bloodshed. We don't want any more recriminations. <laughs> let's have truth and reconciliation, and let's all work, move forward together. Uh, there's, there's a number of elements to this story that, that kind of speak to, uh, you know, the conspiracy theorist in, in, in all of us. Um, I, I would agree with you as far as the date uh, as to when he died. Um, I, I also believe that he died a few months ago. And for whatever reason, they, they kept it on the down low and, mm. uh, and, and released it at a specific time that they, they thought was, um, was best. Uh, because yeah. I distinctly remember this when he was in hospital and when he was in hospital, the reports that we were getting was that, you know, this is not good. He is on death's door. You know, he's going to yeah. die any fucking second. 
And then the reports came out that he had, in fact, died. That, had, that and then it was really? like, yeah, and there were that, reports saying that he was dead. I, I remember reading it on Twitter that, uh, and, and not oh. from not from like you know just some fucking dope in his basement. I mean, like legit, <laughs> le, legitimate posts saying uh, we've we're hearing that Nelson Mandela has passed on, and then, nice. oh no, he's all right, but we're moving him to his house. Yeah. So the feeling that I have, and of course, this is all speculation. What what the fuck do we know? Nothing. But the feeling that I have is that he died then. Mm. And for whatever reason, reasons that that are not known to us, um, they decided to withhold that news until just a few days ago. Yep. That's right, and um, but I didn't realise news reports had actually come out that he died. I mean, I knew I was expecting them any moment. I had an obituary drafted yeah. and ready to go. I was going to upload it. Now, now there's something else that that I want to throw out throw out here is Henry Kissinger. Are, are you familiar with this, Ben? You must be familiar. Yes, with this. this is very interesting. This, so yeah. H- Henry Kissinger, they were on. This was like in the the late '80s, early '90s, and they were talking about uh, apartheid and blah blah blah, and you know the white minority ruling the black majority and whatever. And Henry Kissinger says, uh, oh, don't worry. Uh, apartheid will be over and done with in 1995. That's right. It was, um, it was David de Villiers who said, who, who actually reported this. Um, there's a guy called Dan Ruart in South Africa who was a friend of David de Villiers, who was a government, um, minister in the 70s. And he did meet up with, he said, Kissinger said, the, the South Africa, we planned it. We've already planned it in advance. South Africa is going to be handed to the ANC in 1995. Right. He was just one year out. Right. And uh, I was going to say Obama. <laughs> and, uh, mm. and Mandela uh, did that in 1994. Yeah. So he was just one year off. But, I mean, that really does speak to what might be going on behind the scenes here. Now that's not to say that Mandela was, you know, up to no good and uh, you know involved in all this nonsense, but I, I strongly think that he was doing the right thing, trying to do the right thing, but was being delicately guided and pushed down certain paths by the powers that be. Yeah, he, he was basically being used to get to where they wanted things to go, in the most diplomatic way possible. Then why um, why uh, switch the date? You know why wait to tell everybody about it? That's well, the question. That's his, his, de- his death? Yes. Yeah. This is a big question. Yeah. I mean, we 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 don't know. I mean, we can speculate till the cows come home, but ultimately, we don't know. I mean, one of the. I mean, the 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 common thing is like, oh well, the movie came out, but that's that's trivial. That that's not the reason. That's probably just no. an, an added financial bonus. Uh, but the, there's definitely some kind of reasoning that's going on here, um, because. It, Certain dates are, are, are very relevant. I mean, to the average person, you know, when you think of certain dates, you think of like, well, it's Christmas, it's Easter, there's, you know, and, and it's not that big of a deal. You know, you think of these things as just nonsense that people get together and hang out and celebrate. But dates are very, very important. Very important. Because dates, specific dates, tie into ritual. And ritual is very, very important to the people that run the world. Very important. Did did he not die? Did they not post it on the day of infamy? Is that the Pearl Harbor? Is that the same day? Uh, I, I'm just trying to think now. I'm no, just uh, talking about dates, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. Isn't December 5th the day of no, infamy? No, it's uh, December 8th. Today. Today, Fourth, today is uh, oh. is the uh, Pearl Harbor thing. I think December 8th. Okay. Oh, well, still around the same time, but I, that's the only thing I can think of right now. I don't know what that would mean. But, yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, but uh, what, what 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 how was it like in in Canada, uh, Trevor? Was there a huge oh, uh, same? You deal? know, okay, I, I okay. I'll I'll tell you right now that I admire Nelson Mandela just on a personal level. How when he was younger and he was like, "Fuck this government, fuck everybody trying to fuck us over," and I admire uh, the tenacity and the strength of someone and having people rally around him to say, "We're not going to take this shit anymore." I, I admire the man, but that's where it ends for me. Uh, even I remember when he became president. I'm like, oh, I was disappointed. I'm like, for me, I'm like, okay, we're gonna fight against uh, uh, an organization that brought us down, and now I'm going to try to work my way into it, and you know, <laughs> convert the mafia into being something benevolent and an amazing organization. You can't do it. Right. So I, I was always disappointed that he he became a politician. Um, 
I don't know, that's my take on Mandela. I uh, I didn't know that Henry Kissinger had said things like that. So when I hear more things about this, I'm like, ah, Mandela, he's just he was in jail for 27 years. Yeah, he's, yeah. Years, maybe in that time, people kept coming to him and offering him things. And but I have another take too. Where the fuck was the media for the 27 years he was in prison? Um, yeah. So, I mean, in Canada, there's uh, I I don't personally know him, but he is on my Facebook, and we do uh, talk via email and whatnot. His name's Ray Hurd, and apparently he knew uh, Mandela. Uh, he even calls him uh, Madabi or something. Like, he's got some kind of name he was allowed to call him. And, and I just said, where were you for 27 years? And I thought he was going <laughs> to show up at my house and kick my ass. But uh, he... You know, I'm like, where was the media for 27 years? And I, I remember growing up. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 41, so I, I've got a clear memory of Mandela in, in the 80s. And I'm like, I don't remember in, in the media ever. Oh, you know, today so and so he's he's spending every day outside the prison until the day he gets out. And well, so it, it's I have concerns about that. And uh, you, you, um, you do bring up a good I, point, know, just, Trevor, because the, 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 I, I remember this specifically. Uh, he was in prison for a long time, right? For twenty was it twenty seven years in, in in prison for 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 committing uh, uh, no crime, right? It was it politi- It was just a political crime. As far as I maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he did get up to some nonsense. I don't know. But he was in prison basically because he he was a political political prisoner. Um, but I remember this around uh, nineteen eighty four, eighty five, moving into the nineties. There was a kind of beginning of a popular culture uh push to to bring this into public consciousness and i remember um was that remember that the, I, I ain't gonna play sun city remember that song in, in the late 80s with the uh, uh bono and, and shit where the uh they were there were all these artists got together and said we're not gonna play these these very lucrative concerts in in sun city in south africa because of apartheid and apartheid yeah. suddenly became this big hot topic, and this was kind of bubbling away, which then kind of led to Mandela's release. So it was it was as if seeds were planted to get the public's consciousness focused on apartheid and uh, Mandela, so that he could be released at a specific time. Absolutely agree. And you spoke of Bono, yeah. who's actually been photographed uh, with Henry Kissinger. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Bono, like, Bono's thinking, up to no good. Yeah, he's a shady fuck. I, I can't Tell say him it too loud. He keeps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was just uh, interviewed, uh, doing an interview recently with this. Yeah, Bono is. I see. It's so weird because you look at him. You look at Bono in like the early '80s and stuff. You know when he's U2 and he's. He's an up and coming rock star, and he's he's got a little bit of a political edge to him. And you think, hey, this guy's pretty cool, you know? He's rocking out some kick ass tunes, and and he's got social conscience, and he's going to be awesome. But then, by the late nineteen eighties, something happened with Bono. Something took place that changed him, and he 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 started hanging out with some shady fucks some piece of garbage politicians. And then something, I, I don't know what it is, but something happened. In, in, in the mid to late, around 88, 89, a, a switch was flipped. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, and he became someone very different. I mean, publicly, he was still all like, you know, we're going to erase the debt and, and, you know, freedom. But, but behind the closed doors, he's hanging out with fucking Henry Kissinger, all these fucking mental cases. He, he's probably been to Bohemian Grove and up to all kinds of shenanigans. And it, it, it's all something happened to him. Something happened. You know, uh, do anyone have any comment on that at all? Um, well, it's just people like as this has happened to several people as Bob Galdoff and others, they they start off. They, off they join too. the yes, charity yes. brigade, don't they? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Geldof too. Same thing happened with him. He he, he was on, he was on the right track, and then something happened. Something yeah. was and changed. They do somehow. They get initiated into a situation. I don't know how whether whether it's deliberate or whether it just happens. They just they're manipulated into it. But Bono Geldof, you know, one minute they're talking about poverty, they're refusing to to to, to play in various set places, and the next minute they're talking. They still say they believe in the fight against poverty, but they're hanging out with people like Bill Gates and George W. Bush right. and Tony Blair, right? And they have tax havens. 
Was mm. it Bob Bono? Is is his money's in like the Cayman Islands and all these, so he doesn't have to pay tax. I mean, how much money do these fucks need? They're already multimillionaires. No, they were already in on this. You said you mentioned this, Garrett, that they Paul Culture. You know that it was a push to put him in the the public yeah. spotlight here, right? Yeah, totally. Totally. What happened? Who? What happened to get these artists to do that? Oh, that's that's so common. I, I don't really. know. I, I don't know, Joe. I mean, some some you can clearly say. I, now, Ben brought up Bob Geldof, and and now this is interesting to me, because I mean, this guy. I mean, he is his heart was in the right place, right? He organized Band Aid and Live Aid, and he was he was the originator of all that to, to raise all that money to help those poor starving people, and and you have nothing but good thoughts for this guy, right? Throughout the nineteen eighties. But as we start approaching the 1990s, this guy started to fucking change. Shit. I mean, his life went to shit, right? Do you guys remember the bullshit that happened to him with Michael Hutchinson, his, his wife fucking committing suicide, and all this nonsense was going on with him? And it can't... It, 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 I mean, I, this, this sounds crazy, I know, but I can't help thinking, be it right or wrong, that he was put in a position where it was like, dude, you got to you got to do what we say. You got to get with the fucking program. And he's like, fuck you. OK, well, let's see what happens. And yeah. chip, chip, chip. Shit starts happening. His life starts crumbling. And before you know it, he's like, all right, OK, what do you want me to do? Yeah, and that was the change. Yeah, you know, Ben. What do you think of that? Is that am I am I the talking fucking nonsense here? What's going on? What do you think? No, I, I think you're absolutely something went wrong. I mean, he, in his case, Galdoff, he was married. What, I forgot the name of his. Was it Paulie Yates? Paulie Yates. Yeah. Wife? This punkish woman. Right. Who, she used who, to they be ended a, up having. She used to be on the Tube. There was this this rock show yes, in the early eighties called the Tube, and she wasn't she wasn't very attractive, but she was very sexy. <laughs> <laughs> she was, she was a bit. She was quite good at the pro, at the program. It's a good show. Well, you know, um, she, gave, they had a she gave up this. Vi- yeah, they had a bunch of kids, and, and, and then and he it went and nuts, she died, dude. Yeah, she killed herself. She committed suicide. And Galdorf at the time, he, he was political hot property because he was hanging out with Margaret right. Thatcher. Right. He was. Um, he was like you said. He he became this sort of international celebrity. They were even going to give him. They wanted to make him the first non-British citizen to get the OBE or something. Because he's he's Irish, not British. Right. And they wanted to give him they wanted to give him um, some medal that only British people can get. Yeah. And of course, I think at some point, I don't know how it happened, but at some point, maybe it was losing his wife or ex-wife or something like that. I don't know exactly what happened, but he something happened. Dude. He changed. Some, something, yeah. He flipped. Bono. And flipped. It's happened to so many people before, and, and in, in other places. Absolutely. And I, I'm pretty sure that if if John Lennon hadn't have been fucking assassinated, steps would have been taken to make him uh, uh, change his mind on certain things. Oh, God, what horrible thought. You know? But it's maybe, maybe. maybe. Because, maybe the, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, we're, we're talking about that. Today is the 33rd anniversary of his murder. Uh, you know, 33 years ago today, he was blown away. And wow. um, he was he basically he went he he went in retirement for five years. He stopped making because he was very, very outspoken, very politically active. Right. I mean, the FBI had files on him. They they bugged his phone. They followed him. He, they were all up his ass. And and he was very, very politically active. And he he told it like it was. And then all of a sudden he has a kid and he drops off the planet for five years. Right. He, he doesn't make any music. He doesn't make any statements. No political. Nothing. He's he's just hanging out at home with his new kid. So the government's like, all right, okay, we will back the fuck off this guy because he's 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 nothing now. He's just some dude at home. Then uh, 1979, early 1980, he starts coming back out. Oh, I'm gonna make a record. He starts making some political statements. He's gonna go on a world tour. He's gonna be involved in some political marches. Boom dead yeah and uh and also um you don't see that happen with artists like bono and stuff like that because they can form right if you because it was like it's if you if you do as we say then um we'll leave you the fuck alone and there'll be some perks in it for you you know we'll hook we'll hook you up if you don't do what we say well then there's going to be issues 
up 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 to and including your death. So well, could, so Nelson Mandela, they could have done the same thing to him, right? Sure, like, of course. Like he's a he's like uh, the Bono of the South Africa, I guess. <laughs> uh, would that be a? I don't know. See, I mean, with Mandela, I don't know. I'm just the, trying to I'm trying to equate <laughs> Bono. The uh, feeling, bought the Irish struggle with the British. And, the feeling I have with Mandela is, and this is just a feeling. It's not based on anything. I might be completely wrong. In fact, I probably am. But the feeling I have with him is that. Um, he was uh, maybe naive and manipulated in such a way where he might have known, but but kind of went along with it, or maybe un unwill unwittingly went along with the manipulation. I think it was just judging by the way he's what I've seen about his life and the way he the things he's said. I think he was unwitting. I don't think he was knew he was being used. I mean, some of the others maybe know who they're working for, really. I mean, the whole thing dates back. It, it all comes back to the Rhodes Network, this this organization that basically runs that whole region of the world, set up by Cecil Rhodes over 100 years ago. Yeah. And what about spending all that time in prison? You know, as Trevor mentioned, you know, where was the, the media coverage then? And also him as uh, personally, I mean, to me, that's amazing how he did spend all that time in prison and it came out and was still kind of intact, I guess. To do this, well, it's it's like, um, you know what, dude? If I put you in prison, you think you would lose it after all that time? Well, not really. I mean, Joe, if you if you're if you're, let's imagine Joe Dunn is politically active, he has some very very specific and hardcore belief systems in how the world should function, and I don't agree with it. So I arrest you and I put you in jail, right? So you're in, so let's just say you're in jail for for a year, and after a year I come and see you and I I, I knock on your cell door. Uh, Mr. Dunn, um, all right, are you ready to talk now? Fuck you! Okay. So wait another five years later. Uh, hello, Mr. Dunn, I'm back again. Are, are you, uh, are you willing to talk to me? Fuck you! Another five years. Ten years in prison. Hello, Mr. Dunn, are you ready, right? And suddenly it's 27 years in prison. Hello, Mr. Yeah, what do you want me to do? Get me the fuck out of here! Right? Yeah. I see your point. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, after a while, it's still you, a long you, time though. After, well, I mean, the guy might probably has a good set of balls on him, right? The guy, the guy probably had some uh, convictions to stand by. But after twenty-seven years, those convictions could, you know, he's like, hey, "Fuck, I've been here for twenty-seven years." You know, I'm, maybe I don't have much longer left. How the fuck do I get out of this man, this madhouse? You know. And then he became president after afterwards. Well, that sweetens the deal, right? It's like, look, Mr. Mandela, you play ball with us, you do what we got to say. Not only will we get you the fuck out of the prison, but how'd you like to be president of this country? Well, you can do what you want to do and get and get things working. Oh, that sounds pretty good. Okay. Right? Mm hmm. So he was used as like a, a puppet because it sounds like Kissinger already knew this. He planned it with he got it within a year. Like they had already planned things around the world. Right. I mean he said ninety five, ninety four. That's that's like a nickel difference exactly. really when, exactly. in terms of I mean, manipulating the world. Sure. I mean that's so that's nothing. Yeah. You know, hey, you are in jail for hey, who knows he wasn't getting his balls licked in jail for <laughs> by whoever he wanted to i mean i mean 27 years we don't know because there was no coverage really and <laughs> he could have been eating steak dinners every night well, of oh, course. so he's in prison I mean, we, we we don't know i mean everything we've just said is is 100 percent speculation right sure, sure. It, 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 it's, pro it's probably nonsense what, what do you think ben um it is speculation but I mean, unfortunately there was actually i mean i see i Never even saw anything of Nelson Mandela until he came from out of jail. I mean, he was, there was no pictures of him published from his right. time in jail at all. We had photos of him before he went into jail. In well, that was the thing. I always remember when, uh, in the late eighties when they would do because with all this uh, rabid ap apartheid stuff that was going on in popular culture at that time, they would show a picture of. They would say Nelson Mandela, who's been in jail for twenty, and they'd show a picture of him. It would always be a picture of this young dude. Yeah, this young guy with a beard, right, looking very, and then that's that's how everybody knew him. That's how I knew I saw him when they were hearing those songs saying "Free Nelson Mandela," and then suddenly this sort of this rather weather beaten old man comes out of jail, and he in nineteen ninety one or whenever he came out, and he just does that famous speech, and 
And the thing about it is anything could have been happening in that time. I mean, I don't, I think it's unlikely that he, he was having steak dinners, as Trevor said, but I mean, he's probably, um, he was a political prisoner in South Africa, and, and but he is no doubt, I mean, it, he has written about his time in jail, and like, there is a note of sincerity in, in his voice that I pick up. I mean, it's, it's something, it, one of these, he's one of these people that somehow feels genuine, and I mean, he, when he talks about the relationship he had with the warders, I mean, one of them in particular became a very close friend of his. Yeah. Um, it's, this, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I may be wrong. I'm just going by what we've been talking about and sure, sure. Yeah. that area, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, they've, they released the news that he's passed on. Um, uh, we, we, we have to kind of weigh this, though, by uh, this is what the mainstream media is. Is, is telling us and we, we we all know from past experience that the main street media and the truth don't usually go hand in hand right uh when you watch the mainstream media you're either being barefaced lied to or you're you're, you're observing some kind of spin it, it's incredibly rare for the mainstream media to tell you accurate factual truth that's not to say that it doesn't happen and I'm sure it does, but it's very, very rare. It's either bullshit and, or spin. Right? And after it happened, um, the whole day of news coverage was a bunch of news, but really it was just a bunch of shows about spins. So or- what they're telling us, um, you really have to question it. Uh, now, whether the listeners have listened to this conversation for the past 15, 20 minutes and thought these guys are out of their fucking minds, they're talking a bunch of bullshit, this is nonsense. I, and, and you know what, listeners? If you think that, you might very well be completely right. But you have to question everything. You cannot sit there and have these retards on TV and on the radio tell you something and just say, oh, oh okay, there you go. Well, that's the end of that then. They've told us uh, that's the truth. There you go. You cannot have that attitude. You have to dig into it. You have to question. You have to think, well, why are they telling us this? What's really going on here? Because we're being lied to and manipulated every single fucking day. And that's all there is to it. Am, am, I, am I crazy or what? No, it's not true. No, definitely question it because... My feeling is I get sick. I'm sick and tired of the media like crying over Nelson Mandela. And I don't mean to, to say that I'm against Nelson Mandela. I admire him for certain things. But I also – I do. I think like you, Gareth. I'm like why is the media just – people in Canada, you ask the media. I mean there's people on TV crying. Oh, he's dead. He's dead. They didn't even know him. <laughs> you know, it, they yeah. they didn't know him other than from what they've they've been um I'd like to almost say indoctrinated to learn about him. Right. So, All right, let's yeah. let's I mean, I'm, Okay, go ahead, man. I was going to say I mean I'm, what what I'm concerned about is that why have they chosen because I mean I agree with with what you guys were saying that that it seems unlikely this there's I think there was a long gap between his death and his and, and his death was announced. According to Jacob Zuma, he died and then, and then, literally within an hour, Zuma was doing this speech saying that Mandela died. Now, I think he died a couple of months before. Why? I mean, I agree. I don't think it's to do with the movie. There must be another reason why yeah. they've decided now is a good time to, to announce it. And I think it could be that we won't, we won't know yet. I think they know why yeah. they've announced it now. They know why they've waited until now. We don't yet. But we may find out. And I think we've got to be on guard for something that will happen that um, we'll maybe say, well, this is why they wait until now. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Well, maybe hindsight's twenty twenty, right? So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how it plays out. But interesting discussion nonetheless. Um, let's change gears a little bit here. Now, this, this clip I, I have here will kind of tie into the discussion that Ben and I had last week about because uh, I mean it wasn't planned that way this way Ben but last week we had a kind of pretty intense conversation about um, employment <laughs> it, 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 it was it wasn't planned that way it just kind of happened but but th- th- this week something uh, something unusual is happening here in the United States whereas fast food workers people who work at McDonald's and Burger King and all all these these fast food joints 
um, are going on strike. And this this is this is very yeah they were striking here too. This is very American though. And I mean, when I saw this clip, and I'm going to play the clip in a, in a minute for you guys, but when other nations go on strike, it's always like the steel workers are going on strike, the coal miners are going on strike, the all these massive huge industries are you know these big in, multi billion industry on strike over here. Fucking the the people who flip burgers are going on strike. And I think that really speaks to the American culture and how it's changed over the last 50 years. Here's the clip. Thousands of workers at fast food chains like McDonald's and Burger King are walking off the job today demanding higher pay. Workers say they cannot live on minimum wage. They want it doubled to $15 an hour. Eyewitness News reporter Darsha Phillips is live outside of McDonald's in Hollywood with more. Darsha. Leslie, another protest is expected to take place outside of this McDonald's in Hollywood. And these protests happening all across the country with workers from Burger King, Wendy's, KFC, Taco Bell, and McDonald's. Now, we haven't seen any of the protests disrupt business or stop business, but they definitely are making some noise. Why do we want it? No. More than 100 fast food workers and their supporters demonstrated outside of this McDonald's in South Los Angeles demanding a higher wage. We want $15 an hour and a union. They work at poverty wages. It's about time that they got paid a living wage, not a poverty wage. This protest is just one among many taking place across the country. In New York, fast food workers and their supporters also protested for higher wages. The same happening in Washington and Atlanta. In total, 100 cities taking part in the protests, hoping for a change. I work two jobs and uh, McDonald's by itself. Uh, even though they give like uh, kind of good hours, it's not enough to help support me. It's, it's very difficult, especially when you have kids to raise. It's, you know, you have to live from check to check, make sure they have everything. The protests and the issue of minimum wage is getting the attention of the president. He called for an increase in the federal minimum wage from $7.25 to $10.10. Ten cents an hour, but the fast food industry says it's created jobs in a difficult economy. The National Restaurant Association released this statement: "Dramatic increases in a starting wage, such as those called for in these rallies, will challenge that job growth history, increase prices for restaurant meals, and lead to fewer jobs created." But workers and their supporters are adamant, saying the wealth can and should be shared. You should not be working and having to choose between paying your rent, feeding your children, and, and having to work three and four jobs, and you have three and four kids at home, single moms. I know people who are doing that. Now, the current minimum wage here in California is $8 an hour. Governor Jerry to law a bill that would allow the minimum wage to increase to $10 an hour over the next three years. That's the latest from Hollywood. I'm Darsha Phillips, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Ooh. They were protesting over here like that. Ooh. $10 an hour. <gasps> oh, my gosh. I rub my That's going to break the bank, isn't it? Ooh. But still, uh, to me, these, these jobs aren't meant to be those kind of jobs where you're like a career you're abs like, um, Joe, you're absolutely correct. And the fact that this is happening tells me something seriously wrong is going on in this country. And I've talked about this before. I've noticed this way back when. when I remember t telling this story. when I This must have been 10 years ago. I ordered a pizza. I ordered a fucking delivery pizza. Domino's or pizza, whatever the fuck. Some fucking nonsense. And I order the pizza. There's a knock. Knock. Oh, pizza's here. I open the door, and there's some old dude. And I remember being like, okay, you know, thanks. Here's the money. Here's a tip. Bye. Mm -hmm. And walking from the front door into the kitchen, holding this pizza, thinking, that's fucking weird. There's an old guy delivering pizza. Some guy who's like 60-something, 60, 60, 70 years old. What the fuck is up with that? Because my experience before that, whenever I'd order pizza, some fucking 17-year-old pimply-faced fucking kid would show up, right? Yeah. Playing rock music, blasting from his fucking car as he pulls up into my driveway and brings his pizza. Because these kind of jobs are designed for kids who are like, uh, you know, want to get some beer money or, 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 you know, some extra cash when they go to college or 
it's it's nonsense jobs, right? Yeah, in your high school. I mean, I worked in fast food when I was in high school. Exactly, exactly. Now, the fact that, that that's changing and people are, are focusing on these jobs to make a living and you're getting older people doing these jobs – and then now you're you're saying, well, we got to get a living wage and a, a union and and all that for these jobs. Tells me that we are rapidly approaching uh, uh, the end of the United States. Well, because you hear it all the time We're as done, well. Um, college uh, people, college degrees, they have to get these kind of jobs, right? You have people, you know what I mean. You have people going to college, right? getting uh, BAs and BS and fucking PhDs and whatever the fuck, and they're flipping burgers because they, they can't get into the career that they want to get into because it's already sewn up. And I'm, before the clip, I mentioned, you know, usually in, in most countries, it's like, and today the union of steel workers is going out on strike, right? The steel workers are going out on strike. Because that's like a major industry. Or um, today, nurses or doctors or teachers are going on str- big industry. Now, it's fucking people who flip burgers. I mean, what is going on? We're, we're, we are we're well, so fucked. We're done. I've, I've got a, I've got a take on it from, a, from the union position. Hello? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, my audio keeps going down a little bit here, so I didn't know if I was on. But, okay. Um, I, when you talk about unions, unions, I think, have opened up the books to major – like you talk about steelworker unions and all that. They've opened the books and went, yeah, these guys aren't lying. There's no money here, so we can't go after them anymore. So now they're going after an industry that – I mean McDonald's and Walmart, they're, they're, they're worth billions. So now I think unions are trying to get into that facet of, hey, you know, I hear about union talk, uh, and I'm not – I'm not a big union guy. I'm just I'm just trying to add some insight to unions. There's no money anymore in um, a lot of these private companies. So they're like, well, shit. Who do we go after now? A lot of unions, at least in Canada, too, are are, are a government. Um, a lot of um, union, yeah, union members are government employees. So I think in the states, yeah, maybe they're looking at, hey, let's go after um, fast food people. And, no, and you're right, Gareth. The, yeah, the end of the American empire is done, dude. I mean, it's Came it's over. just when when you're talking, and I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to demean anybody doing these jobs because it seems like it's the only fucking jobs left of course, in America. Of course, dude. And it's it's like it's. I feel like okay. Um, you can't demean these people. I watched a, I watched a kid yesterday. A kid. There was a guy my age, forty years old. I bet you pushing shopping carts through the parking lot right. at Walmart. Right now, mind you. This is all bumpy and icy and snowy, and I'm looking at him going, I- I'm a paycheck away from being him. Right. I mean, if I, if, if I ever lost my job sure. and shit went to – I mean, I'd be pushing shopping carts too. It's oh, a scary yeah. feeling, isn't it? No, it's, it's it totally is a true. scary feeling because I go – so you're right, Gareth, when you say, hey, everybody should be waking up going, this isn't a good thing where unions now no. are trying to get it. I mean, into Walmart's and, and people are pushing for these jobs that are that are entry level jobs. These are the only or, jobs available. Old people, these are old the people only now fucking now jobs available. These are the only jobs available. Yeah. Right. When when you can't demean these people, do you think these people want to be working at McDonald's? Come on, please. They're McDonald's. They want to do that shit. Of course not. They do oh. it. They do it because they have to. Because if yeah, they yeah. if they don't do these jobs, they're standing at a freeway entrance holding a fucking sign. Right? You're Say, exactly right. You know? That's yeah. where it's coming to. It used to be, oh yeah, the steel workers, you lose your job. So you can you you get it's getting so bad now that it's getting down to and I'm, I'm it doesn't take anything to flip a burger or anything. I'm not demeaning it, but it's a scary thought to think this is right. what America's striking for and, and now? you know what's crazy, dude, is like there's, there's people who are probably listening to this podcast right now, and they it's like, well, I don't know what these guys are talking about. I I got a I got a decent job. I, you know, I'm I'm making good money. I got a I got a you know I got a four hundred one k. I got a car. I got a house. I'm I'm good. What are they talking about? Things aren't that bad. Well, dude, you, you're living a, an illusionary life because things are bad. Things are really fucked up. And right now, you might be cozy in your your uh, your nice paycheck and your 401k. Five years from now, let's talk. Because things are going to be very fucking different. Trust me. The gap between rich and poor is just, it's, it's huge. 
Well, what Trevor just mm-hmm. said right now is 100% accurate. When he says, you know, he's he's seeing some fucking poor bastard pushing a, pushing a fucking trolley at Walmart, and he's saying, you know what? That's a, a paycheck between me and him. No, life is very precarious now, isn't it? Right? That, it's getting more, life exactly. is getting more and more precarious. Exactly. I mean, in Britain, we've even got, they've even reorganized the class system in Britain. And they have a, they have a completely new class of people. Um, it's not like the there's the working class, there's the educated in training working class, and then there's the precariat. And they actually call us the precariat, <laughs> and that includes me. I mean, I'm I'm a member of the precariat now. Uh, well, I, I I've always been. Well, they never used to call it that, you see. But but it's it's true. I mean, we we. I mean, there's there's a there's a good side. There's a the good side to this. I mean, I agree with what you guys have said about this. Is this is a sign of the times? The fact that people are now doing um, jobs such as in McDonald's for life. It is now a, a lifetime occupation they can't get out of. And you're right. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if very, very few of them enjoy it. And I mean, I think we were... Was it you and me were talking yeah, last we week, Yeah, we talked Gareth, about it last week, yeah. And we were saying that they did a survey that only 20% of people say they enjoy doing their job. And I, and I think that's grossly overestimated. I, I, yeah. I think that, that 20% is, is, is way out of touch. I think it's far lower than that. So it means that um, 80% of people, more plus... 80% of people plus are actually spend eight hours every day doing something they do not like. Right. They're hating life. No. But they're doing it yeah. because they have to. Right? They have I to mean, do it. They don't want to do it. They have to do it. I mean, it. I take I take heart from the from the fact that these people the, 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 these people are in this job. They're in this flipping burgers job. They've settled down in there and realized they've got to keep at it. So they, they can do one of two things. They can just keep their heads down as much as they can and just do everything. It will take all the shit that everyone throws at them because they're so terrified of losing their jobs. Or they can take the positive. These people have taken a positive decision that they want to improve their lives. And they're, right. you know, they're, they're going out on the street and they're protesting and they say, we want better life. We want a better wage. If we're going to have to do this for life, then we want a living wage. Well, you know, you, and I think that's fair you got, enough. You got the, like the CEO of McDonald's making 30 million plus a year. Right. Do you know Obama? Right, talking about raising the minimum wage. They, they, they've not mentioned that in this country yet. The minimum wage is still at a certain level. Yet MPs have just voted themselves an eleven percent pay rise. I wish I could vote myself a bloody pay I know, rise. It's so awesome, huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 yes. We, we we need some more money. Yes, yes. I mean, these this uh, hookers and blow are getting quite expensive. Let's give ourselves a eleven uh, percent pay increase. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> fuck, fuck you. <laughs> These maniacs! Why, oh my god, it's unbelievable. I just, um, I just hope what they do, if they really, really want to settle, they really want to do uh, improve their lives enormously. They can do it. what they did. You know, there's a French um, supermarket chain. I think it's owned by Walmart, where they, where the management were going to shut it down. So what happened was that the people who who were made redundant, they pulled their redundancy money and they bought the place and they reowned it under their own right. as under their own business and they made a roaring success. Now, you think about this, right? I want to just put this out there. Let's just imagine that I'm the CEO of McDonald's, right? And I've been the CEO for, let's say, five years, right? And when I became the CEO, I was making $2 million a year cash, right? My fucking salary. Two mil a year in my pocket. Now it's five years later. I'm making $30 million a year. My own personal finances. Now, you got some fucking retard flipping burgers saying, uh, you know, how can I help you today? You want fries with that? Making $4 an hour or whatever the fuck it, eight bucks an hour, right? I'm making $30 million a year. So what if I was to say, you know what? I'm making $30 million. What the fuck do I need $30 million for? I got more money I know what the fuck to do with. How about I take a drastic pay cut and, you know, you know what? Let's go fucking crazy. How about you just give me $300,000 a year, which is an absolute fortune for 99% of the population of the planet. And the rest of that money that I'm getting that I don't know what the fuck to do with, how about we invest that in our employees and we give them a couple of bucks extra? How about we do that? Is that crazy? Am I out of my mind to think about <laughs> that, doing that, something like that? Am I a mental that makes case? Sense. That makes sense, but that wouldn't happen. It's never going to happen. Never. Now imagine if this fool did something like that. Society would be better in the long run, I think, if if that happened if, all around. If he did that, 
How do you think his employees would view him and the company? How, how do you think their attitude about going to work every day would change? Be night they'd be a lot happy. They'd be a lot happier. It'd be night and fight. They would worship that stupid ass. They would be there on time every day, uniform pressed, ready to fucking go. Again, though, I think this ties into, and I agree, Gareth. I'm like, why doesn't Walmart pay him an extra buck an hour? Is it right, going to hurt them? Of course. But, but my thing is, I don't want people to be in those jobs. I'd like to get them out. So sometimes I think the more money we pay to to do those jobs, maybe keeps people there longer. I, I don't know. I just I'm trying to think of different ideas on this. And Robots are going to be doing those jobs anyway. <laughs> Pretty much. So, yes. In the future. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Joe. You're right. Well, what I'd like to see. Don't you happen. want I mean, prize with that? <laughs> what, what I'd like to see happen is we'd like to see those guys, those guys in the various different stores, and the various different restaurants, as they call them. Although that's a that's a pretty loose term for yeah. one of those institutions. They they offer to buy. They could offer to buy the the branch off the company. Now that would be great because if they really, really are serious about improving their lives, offer to buy the branch off the company. And then they open it up under their own name. I mean, it could be part of a new franchise or it could be completely independent and, and completely um, separate. And then they run it themselves. And I bet you any, anything, I know I would do this. If I was walking down the high street and there's McDonald's on one side and there's this independent um, one on the, a burger, burger bar on the other side, I go into the independent one every day, every day of the week and twice on Sundays. I've already used that expression, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's what I would do. Yeah, but dude, the, you you could spend fifty p on a burger at McDonald's or three pounds on a burger at some at Joe Blow's Burger Hut. What are you going to do? Well, I think if enough people, I mean, if, originally, and this is the what, problem. What are you going to do, this, Ben? Be honest. What are you going to do? I know. Well, I I hope. I what would, you, Ben? I mean, I, ben? I'm, I'm actually, Gareth, I'm in this position. I'm in. This what are you going to do? I'm, I'm. I actually do shop at sm- small local businesses, and even now, and I, and I avoid. We don't even them. have them. Why? Why do you think Walmart is so huge? Why do you think it's because when it, it, people be, choose the thing is if people chose to use the small businesses they'd be able to bring down their prices because they become no, more popular. No, the, the small because, businesses had to charge a lot more ben, because what would problem. happen? What would happen is but if they wouldn't if, have to. They wouldn't have to if enough people used them. No, because if if what what you're describing came to fruition, Ben, certain small businesses would become the next Walmart. It depends. I'm not if that not if they if the if the people remained independent and they remained in, and they kept their stores independent they they had a franchise instead of like just everyone buying one big company buying up the same store i mean there's a branch of small businesses in britain called nicer and each each shop is independently run but it's part it buys into a franchise so it's kind of a mm. it's all kind of workers cooperative cartel and those those shops are absolutely wonderful I mean, you can see it in the eyes of the people who are actually working there how different how much happier they look and the poor slobs who are in Tesco's, you know, stacking no. shelves for 50p an hour. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, I know it's a small step. And of course, if you go into a nicer shop, you have to pay more. But I, I, I do that. And I'm, I'm not that well off right now, but I, I can do it. I can live using small businesses. And if I can do it, I mean, I could certainly do it when I was a porter and other people can do it. Yeah. But I, I think, uh, I, I hear you, man. I think, uh, you know, your heart's in the right place. But, um, I don't know. It's going to be very interesting to see how this 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 kind of plays out. The 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 feeling I'm getting is that we're 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 either up to our necks in it and unaware of it, or we're rapidly approaching the beginning of the end. Well, it's sad, you know, Gareth, because you know I told you about the People's Supermarket Ox- in Oxford. Yeah. Do you remember me telling you about that? Well, it's shut, and this is this is a very very sad thing. I just I was in there last week painting, helping paint it because they want to they want to try and get their deposit back on the rent. On, on, and so I've been helping paint the thing so they can hand it back to the landlord. And it's really, really sad. It's gone. I'm, I'm going to miss it badly. And I hope they, as soon as they, if they open up again somewhere else, I'll buy a share and I'll join them again. Yeah. Well, 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 I think you're right, Gareth. You just opened my mind and scared me a bit more. And you said the end of America is coming. If, if fast food workers are on strike, you're fucked. <laughs> I know, dude. I mean, fast food, I mean, that should be just like a little job that some. You know, some kid does for for six months, and then he's on yeah. on to. I, the I, people, I flipped burgers at uh, I, you got them in the states called Harvey's. Do you have Harvey's or? Uh, it, yeah, it's like a McDonald's, like a Wendy's yeah, we do. kind of Harvey's. Yeah, I, I were I was seventeen, and I used to open the restaurant at five a.m. and I used to throw open the toilet because I was always drunk when I came in, <laughs> and and my job was <laughs> I'll to. I'll never um, eat there again. <laughs> 
Harvey's. <laughs> and it gave me it gave me enough money so that on Friday nights I could buy a right. Mickey uh, vodka. And, and but that up. that was it. You know, I worked there in a seventeen, and I, I I think I just I didn't show up. I think they called me and said, "Are you coming in?" I was yeah. like, no. I was like, but that's the kind of job that I think that is. It, it's good for it was good for me in high school. Sure. Um, you do and, and if you're there was a few college people that worked there, and they're always like, oh, you know, this is you know, this is spending money. You do you do it, you it's, do it it's, for it's a, bus for a fare. couple extra bucks, and you do it for a few months, maybe a year, and then you're out of there. But the fact that yeah. now people, this is part of their livelihood. They're they're it, it tells you, yeah, it, kids. It's a huge red flag that we are done. Yeah, but if that's the only job you can get now, and and um, how many people in that clip were saying, "Well, you know, I work three jobs right now." Yeah, yeah, and I'll bet you they're RA my age or yeah. RA. It's like and, a, the, 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 I think it's sad. Life. Like I, a forty year. If I was having to push shopping carts right now through Walmart, I, I, I would be. I'd be so sad. Sure, but, pe- but I, I'd, pe- I would. I mean, I'm getting it. to the point. I'm telling you, if I did, people are doing it, dude. Hey, I got you know people got bills. They got kids. Exactly. Um, so all all I gotta say before we we beat this to death is this is a very real reality. And all I can say to our listeners is that the next time you are out in one of these establishments munching on your burger, don't be a dick, right? Don't be a prick to these people. Be cool. Be courteous. Be awesome. Smile. Say thank you. Be pleasant. Yeah. Don't yeah. be a it fucking could be asshole. Three months. Don't be an be, asshole. Be nice. Because it could be you in three be, months. Be too. cool with them, you know. Treat them with respect and dignity. Don't be a prick to these people, because I've seen it. My, I didn't order this. What the? You know, you see these maniacs <laughs> acting all stupid in there. Be cool with these people, because you know they're, they're dealing with nonsense. This is not their life stream to be flipping these burgers and, and dealing with this bullshit. They're doing it because they have to, not because they want to. All right, let's change gears here. Final story of the day. Uh, something to do with DNA. DNA. Looks like huma- right. humanity is a lot older than we thought it was, or at least mainstream science says it was. Scientists say they found human DNA from a fossil that's 400,000 years old. Until now, the oldest known DNA went back a mere 100,000 years old. But this morning, the breakthrough is only leading to new questions about who we are and how we evolved. CBS This Morning contributor Michio Kaku is a physics professor at City College of New York. Good morning. Morning. So tell us about this. Recovering human DNA that's 400,000 years old has shattered all records. It's a game changer. Scientists are going ape over this result (laughs) because it forces us to revise all the textbooks. It throws a monkey wrench in the standard textbook. The textbooks say that during the last ice age, we coexisted with the Neanderthals. It was just them and us, period, end of story. Now we realize that there were other subspecies of humans that walked the earth simultaneous with us. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. You say it also tells us that there was interspecies mingling. What's that? Mating between humans, Neanderthals, and the Denisovans, and maybe even a fourth variety of humans. We didn't think think they were hanging out together? (laughs) Well, we didn't know that we were flirting with each other. They were hanging out, but they weren't mating. (laughs) Think of Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings. You have humans, the orcs, the elves, the dwarves. There's a menagerie of different kinds of humans. That's the way it might have been 400,000 years ago. It's like finding out at Thanksgiving time that you have relatives that you didn't know before. Now we realize it it wasn't just the Neanderthals and us. There were other species of humans that walked the surface of the Earth. So when scientists go ape, what do they do? Well, (laughs) they try to get ancient DNA to try to recover what it was like so many hundred thousand years ago. And like I said, this was a monkey wrench in the standard textbook. All high school textbooks are going to have to be rewritten to uh, so, revise well, our right. origins. It's really cool, but why does it? What does it matter today? Why does it matter today? How does it change things? Well, first of all, all of us apparently, or m- many of us, have a little bit of Neanderthal DNA in our genome. Perhaps a few percent. <laughs> yeah, I, I've that. known that about a couple of men I know. I can tell you that. Well, it's true. Did you buy at the table? A few percent. <laughs> <laughs> That's where that behavior came from. <laughs> But, I mean, this is really serious. You're saying it can change textbooks. I mean, this gives us new understanding about evolution. That's right. Crucial 
That's right. reason we're here. Right. We used to think that we humans were the only line, the yeah. only lineage yeah. that went back hundreds of thousands of years. But think of a branch. Now we realize that there are other leaves. There are other branches, other leaves on the tree of life. And the tree of life becomes much more interesting and fascinating than before. I mean, what other human-like creatures walk the surface of the earth? We're going to push this back more than just 400,000 years. We're going to eventually go back perhaps a million years into the past. Whoa. I'm excited. I am, I'm too. This is deep. Yes, it is. This is very deep. I'm good. <laughs> this just really is. I mean, it's yeah. serious stuff. It challenges who we are exactly. and, and where we come from. Thank exactly. You. Questions we've been asking about. <laughs> <laughs> For a long time. For a long time. Yes. It's, Thank you, Professor. It's interesting, though, they said that this was a serious topic and that it was deep, but they continually laugh and make jokes. Is that, I know. What's up with that? Is that because they're nervous? Is that because it's like a nervous laughter? Because they, they have to kind of belittle this subject, because if they address it seriously, there are serious consequences. And, and how does how does this work? 400,000 years old? Everyone knows that the Bible teaches us that the earth is only 12,000 years old. Surely. I thought it was 6,000. <laughs> You're not one of these... Riv- you, you could get burned at the stake for saying 12,000 gallons. Well, but, but that's the disturbing thing, dude, is that there are, there are people out there, especially here in the U.S., that really do believe... That the Earth is six to twelve thousand years old, not just mankind. Most fifty percent, actually. The Earth, Americans. The Earth. Mm. So, what's your take on this new story, Ben? Four hundred thousand years old, new DNA. This is uh, well. It seems this is really, really interesting because I mean, I've been reading about the hidden history of the human race. I've Michael Cremo and Forbidden Archaeology, yeah. and several other. Um, books similar which is talking about how not only human civilization is much older than we think it is but also human species are our are, are species human pe- beings are older than we think they are and basically there's been a massive cover-up and a big mix-up of of our past in, in archaeology by archeo- archaeological academics and the thing is even within the the official story they keep changing they have changed their um mind so many times about how old humans are they originally we, there were no anatomically modern humans before 100,000 years ago right. that's been pushed back now to 400,000 it goes back even even further and they bring up sure, new sure. species i mean there's even talk now that neanderthals might actually be two separate species that have been mixed up yeah. and things like that yeah i mean it- so this is really interesting stuff well, it's fascinating. I mean, the, the fact that they keep revising this stuff, it, 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 I mean, it shows that science is working, right? There, because there's no definitive answer. Science, if science, if science is being accurately done, uh, there will constantly be revisions. Things will constantly yeah. change as we learn more and understand things more. Things will change. So the fact that this has come out and that they are uh, presenting new evidence kind of gives me a, a kind of ray of hope that real science is being practiced somewhere on earth because but I, in a lot of other places it ain't <laughs> you know yeah but, but it'd be covered up and then and mock made a mockery of in the media as, it, as you heard in this clip well they're laughing yeah oh i, I yeah. once knew a man where there was a neanderthal oh, no. so funny i know many men i know many of those i know it's like why are you laughing about this this is serious shit we're talking about the origin of mankind and uh the scientists even said that you know they're going to go back a million years right so imagine that well i mean i I believe, and I'm, I'm sure Ben will will echo this statement, is that mankind is not 400,000 years old. We're, we're millions of years old. Well, it's absolutely true, Gareth. I mean, if you actually um, read some of the alternative literature, there's distinct evidence of humans going back many, many um, m- millions of years. And there's, there's even artifacts that have been found. Sure which are many million years, millions of years old that are artificial. For instance, uh, things like um, a, a gold chain or a copper chain that was found embedded in a piece of coal yeah. that was dug out of a mine a thousand feet deep. Right. Yeah, um, but these, these, all kinds of- these things, I mean, th- now they're, they're focusing on this DNA evidence, right? And, and, and deservedly so, right? It's it, it, apparently legitimate DNA evidence that proves uh, mankind was around 400,000 years old. Uh, so this makes the news. But like you just mentioned, Ben, they find a, 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 an artificial man-made chain in coal, which is several million years old. And this is legitimate. It's, it's, it's not a fake. It's 100% real. 
but it's completely ignored. It's sidestepped and pushed to one side because that does not fit with the model of the origin of humanity. So that so yeah. instead of revising everything and really starting to think about, well, how do we get here? What's really going on? It's easier just to ignore it. Well, you, so yeah, me, that's, saying that's cool. a huge discovery. Sure, exactly. But they ignore it. Now, there's many, many cases like this. There's um, those uh, those spherical balls with a groove around it that were found in South Africa from layers of Earth, which literally are millions of years old. And these these yeah. these balls with the grooves around them, they're 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 artificial. These do not. I think they're actually. I think those balls are actually one and a half billion years billion, old. Now, that's billion. Yeah. That's... At that time, there was nothing supposed to be. The only life on Earth was my, was single cells, right. archaea. So what what that tells according us, according to the official story. So what that tells us, Ben, is that um, either um, our whole process of carbon dating and and dating the the uh, the world and history is completely wrong and completely flawed and absolute nonsense or mankind has been around for a very 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 long time well it certainly proves we've been playing cricket for a long time because those <laughs> those <laughs> balls look exactly like cricket they do balls, they do but, like cricket. they're made of metal but apart from that uh, but you know you were saying before about how science is you were pleased that science is working because they're revising these various ages of, of human DNA, things like that, which Michio Kaku was talking about. And it's true. I mean, it's, that is encouraging in a way. But I, I wonder, are they going far enough? Are they revising enough? It's no. almost like no, they're willing to not. go so far, but there's a, right. there's a line they will not cross, even if the sure. evidence is, is taking them over that line. Oh, absolutely. And you look at something like uh, Michael Cremo's book, Forbidden Archaeology, and he presents so many cases of archaeological discoveries which really throw conventional thought as to the origin of mankind for a loop that yeah. uh, it, it it's ignored. It's it's completely pushed to one side. And well, we'll let's just pretend that this evidence doesn't exist. Because well, in the book, in the book, he not only presents massive amount of evidence. I mean, yeah. that book is Huge. over a hundred thousand words. Yeah. But it's about 700 pages. But also there's a very, very plausible explanation and a very, very thought out explanation on why this this um, forbidden archaeology phenomenon actually exists. And what is that, Ben? Please tell us. He's, he's saying it's basically a mixture of political pressures and um, herding instinct and dogma. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably a common, it's probably a lot of com political pressures which probably leads to the second two. Yeah, I would agree. Political and religious. I would, yeah, I would, yes. I, I would think that um, you guys. Um, I, I, for my research, um, Lloyd Pye. Yeah, is, yeah, he has a two-hour video. Everything you know is wrong, and and um, yeah. that guy blew my mind. He said, like, look, at, I he I don't know if people, humans, I guess, are even indigenous to this planet. Sure. For for simple fact, look, if we're we're the, one of the only creatures, I think the only creature that has to put clothing on to survive outside. Uh, look, you put a dog outside, you know, they, they're okay. Like animals are okay outside, but we would die from radiation poisoning after two weeks. If we were sent outside with no clothes on, you, you would die in the elements. So well, just simple um, things like that I think about and I go, are we even indigenous to this planet? Uh, right. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a guy, another scientist came out just a few weeks ago. I'm trying to remember, and I'm, I might get this wrong, but I'm going to try. He said that, uh, that he, that there's definitive proof that, that mankind does not originate on Earth. Um, one was because of pain during childbirth, right? No, there's no other animal that gives birth to, uh, uh, its offspring and goes through excruciating pain, right? It's only humans that do that. And, and that's because, and, and he says it's because of, uh, of gravity, of the gravity of the planet, the, 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 the force of gravity. It, it, we're not indigenous to this gravity. Uh, and there was something else too. I'm trying to think what it was. There, there was another reason he uh, he gave. Um, I, I can't think. It's it, it, total brain but, fart. It, but, but the one for me is uh, we have no hair on our body. Right. Really. Yeah. We're hairless creatures, and you know, if a hairless creature, it's it lives in the ocean like a dolphin. I mean, it doesn't get affected by just just the simple fact we don't have hair on our body uh, because we're land creatures that. That makes me wonder: Are we are we indigenous to this planet? Um, especially, and then I hear things like they, they talk. Well, we're we're just evolved from the Neanderthal. There's a missing link. Well, when you look at the physical structure of a Neanderthal, 
there'd have to be 20 cousins in between there to get where we're at. Just, it, it would take millions of years. So I, I well, don't know. Here we go. I found the thing here. So this was um, – this this guy, this scientist says that um, uh, the – there's a number of reasons that prove that humanity is not indigenous to this planet, that we were from someplace else and were deposited here, um, you know, a while ago. Uh, one is uh, back pain. Um, he says that uh, humans suffer from back pain because they evolved on a world with lower gravity. Um, and he also says that it's strange that babies' heads are so large that they make it difficult for women to give birth, resulting in fatalities in earlier time and pain during childbirth. Um, what else does he say? A uh, sunburn. He says, uh, for why, why, why do people get sunburned? Um, if, if we evolved on this planet, this, sh we shouldn't be getting sunburned because we should have adapted to the environment and therefore, you know, what are we getting sunburned from? Uh, what else did he say? Uh, this is, uh, uh, he says uh, humans always get ill, they always get sick because their body clocks have evolved to uh, their body clocks have evolved in an environment for a 25 hour day, whereas Earth is 24. Therefore, we're thrown off. We're going to get sick. And also, and this is something that that's very interesting to me, and I don't know what you guys think of this, but I'm going to throw it out there, is that people in general, have an innate feeling deep inside themselves that they're from elsewhere. What do you guys think of that? It is interesting. I, I, always, looked at, I always looked at the stars, you know. There's, there's an, I think an, we're an, fascinated an, by an it. An innate feeling like this is not where we're really from, you know. There's a, there are certain individuals... Who, who call themselves star people and they actually say, I'm, this isn't, this, I'm not from here, and they have regular contact with extraterrestrial beings, and they say, I'm, I'm here, but I, I'm, this is just me visiting. I'm not really meant to be here. And they say this very, very sincerely all through their lives, not just when they're kids, but when they grow up. Yeah. It's, it's certainly, and there's a very interesting thing about how the the day on Mars, you know, is about, is about 23 minutes longer than the day on Earth because right. Mars spins slightly slower. Right. And people, there's someone did an experiment once where they put people in a in an area where they didn't have sunlight to try and disrupt their circadian rhythm, which is your your cycle in your body, which takes you through the 24 hour cycle of the day as it's linked to your body. And they found that people's rhythm eventually adjusted to the length of the Martian day. I don't, I don't know if that was confirmed. I don't know how true that is. Yeah. This is just what I heard. So this doctor, I'm going to read what he says here. Uh, he says that many people feel they don't belong or feel at home on Earth. He said this suggests that mankind may have evolved on a different planet and that we may have been brought here already as a highly developed species. He says, uh, one reason for this is that the Earth might be a prison planet. And since, uh, and since we seem to be natu a naturally violent species, we may be put here until we learn to behave ourselves. Hmm. Uh, you know, Gareth, when you're saying that, uh, you know what I was thinking? The English used to put people on Australia. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as a, pr I'm a thinking, prison. I, you know, as you're saying that, I, 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 I'm the whole time I'm sitting here thinking, you know, the English used to dump prisoners off and I'd be like oh okay yeah put me on this uh, desert beach nice yeah. area oh but yeah what if we are I thought of that theory so his, his the it says this is what he says he says my thesis proposes that mankind did not evolve from a particular strain of life uh, but evolved elsewhere and was transported to earth as a fully evolved homo sapien somewhere between 60,000 and 200,000 years ago. Yeah, that time frame is much different than this latest DNA discovery. Well, the DNA discovery that they that they were talking about in that clip was a a strand was was a different species of human. They they weren't uh, homo sapiens. They were they were something else. They they were they were related to humans, right? It was definitely related, but they weren't uh, human beings as we see human beings today. So our current species is right. the one that was here. Right. There were already humans before that. Well, different different 
different different, br- different breeds of humans, like dogs. You know, like you, you look at like uh, a little little uh, uh, what they call those little tiny little dogs, and you look at like uh, German Shepherd, right? You, you look at them, and you, they're completely different breeds, but they're the same species. I also think that they'll they'll end up finding stuff on Mars if they haven't already. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I, things I, like I, this. I would agree. So, I think I mean, they already have, but they're just they're, yeah. I mean, it's been, they've been ever since the Mariner and Viking missions, they found things yeah. which they then just made a joke out of when really they shouldn't be. They should so, be but, investigating them but more. Th- these are interesting things, though. When you think about that, the human head, uh, when when it's being born, is too big for for the opening. Therefore, it causes excruciating pain to the to the female giving birth. Right. Whereas every other animal on this planet, they're just like, oh, I'm pregnant. It's like it's like farting. You know, oh, there's a kid, right? You look at a horse or a deer or whatever; they just they just fucking plop these things out like nothing. It's different, right? It's like no, they, know, don't, they don't have midwives no, in the maternity hospitals. Oh, though. you know what? The, the the kid is ready. Boop! There you go. Next, it's like nothing. Whereas human beings are in agony giving birth because the head is too big. You know, it really makes you think, and, and sunburn. You think, you really, you think, oh, what, what are people getting sunburned for? What the fuck's up with that shit? We, if we, if we natively evolved on this planet, what's what, sunburn? What is that? That's a good point. I never really thought of that, and then um, that really stood out to me in that. You know, because it makes you, you think. think we would have evolved, our skin would evolve. Of course. What do you need sunburn for? What does, what's up with that shit? Unless you came from someplace else. Right? Exactly. The sunburn thing is a big catcher for me. Yeah? I mean, pain during childbirth, sunburn, bad backs. Why would you have a bad back if, if, if uh, <laughs> you know? I mean, you ever, Why, yeah, do you ever, hear, you ever hear of a fucking horse? Oh, my back is fucking killing me. What's up with this? Or, or a cow? Oh, my back. No, because they, were, really? they evolved in this gravity, so their backs are cool. But people, oh, Christ, my fucking back. Because the gravity on this planet is not in match with our physiology because we're out from elsewhere. Well, we are pretty unique. I mean, as far as animal species go, we're, we're one of the most unique species in, in the animal kingdom. I mean, we are... There, there are people, of course, Richard Dawkins says that we are related to the apes. <laughs> and uh, I mean, in terms of DNA terms, there's no doubt that sure. there is this link I, and, I and to the apes. But the thing about it is we're not like other, I'm Trevor's pointing out how we have no hair, which is extremely unusual for primates. Right. We also, uh, we, we don't climb trees. We're the only primate that is not an arboreal species. And we actually never, we're never an arboreal species. And we actually live permanently on the ground. Yeah. So we have these flat feet. We have this upright posture. And our heads, our heads are so unusual because of this, our brain size, which is the largest right. brain of any primate, gives us this high intelligence, but it makes our heads look really unusual for an ape. Yeah. So this dude, I mean, you can research him on- online. It's uh, Dr. Ellis Silver, PhD. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he's he's a real doctor of a PhD and all that stuff. And and uh, and all he's doing is is postulating this theory that we might be from elsewhere and he presents some uh, some rudimentary uh, evidence that 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 ties into it. There's uh, one more thing I've got to mention is yeah. the nose, our noses. Yeah. Right. There's there's something very very unusual about our noses, right? Now, one one if you if you put an ape or a gorilla in the water, they will some of them will swim, but they're very careful not to get their head underwater because if they do, their nose immediately floods and they they splutter. Right. All right. And they can't actually swim underwater because their nose is – our nose has a kind of a diving bell effect because our nostrils point downwards. And oh, none of the yeah. – all the other apes even point sideways or upwards. So that yeah. indicates that – Trevor, you were saying we, we – along with our hairless configuration, maybe we are descended from a, a semi-aquatic species. Interesting. Have you, you seen see Waterworld? That- yeah, did you ever see that film about mermaids? I mean, I know it's it's been no, it's uh, denounced as a, as, a, as a docudrama. I mean, I thought it was real, but it's probably not. But – it's so it's a big subject to go into, but it's possible that we split off from the other apes if if we didn't even come from somewhere else, um, or maybe we come from another planet where we were developed separately and we were a semi-aquatic species and we were brought down here and we were we were we were we were, we were engineered into a land species, right. but we still have this aquatic this aquatic nature. We have, for instance, this nose which it doesn't flood when you put your head underwater, and we right. have um, hairless skin. Yeah, and everybody loves and everybody loves to go swimming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Do. Yeah, we yeah. swim in the sea all the time. Absolutely. I think ninety percent of human beings live within a um, hundred miles of the sea. Yeah, yeah. 
something like that. In Australia, it's 99% of the population live within 10 miles of the sea. Well, there you go, guys. I mean, uh, it's definitely fascinating, definitely interesting. I uh, I don't know what else to say about this subject. Just it's very, very thought-provoking. But let's leave it at there, and let's let's start to wrap up the show. Uh, I want to thank you all for taking part. Uh, once again, great conversation, great topics, great discussion. Um, let's see where everyone can be found. Let's start with Trevor this week. Trevor, where can you be discovered on the Internet? Oh, oh, just check me out on Facebook. I have a page there, uh, Bigfoot Mountain Survival Gear on eBay. Yeah, pretty much just. Just look me up there, Trevor Murray, or Bigfoot Mountain Survival Gear. There you go. Excellent. Joe, where can you be found? You can go to MindsetCentral.com and uh, check out Mindset Daily and Mindset Radio Hour and Mindset Live. Oh, yeah. We got a new new episode of Mindset Live going live. Well, not live, but we'll be able to download (laughs) download it tomorrow. Yeah, it was a lot of fun this week. Yeah, it was a good good one. Yeah. Uh, And Ben, where can you be discovered on, uh, on the Internet? Hapanwo, H-P-A-N-W-O, Hospital Porters Against the New World Order. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate another great show. Uh, We'll be back uh, next week with more topics and more discussions. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, once again, farewell, good brothers.